Um, Welcome to the, um, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the August 12, 2019 selections, Selectments Meeting. Tonight, first, we're going to have a public hearing. Do you have the... Um, the notice? Yes. I do, sir. Thank you. I have it, too, but... Want me to read it? Yes, please. Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, the Town of Hampton Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on Monday, August 12, 2019, in the Selectmen's Meeting Room 100 Winniconnet Road, Hampton, New Hampshire, at 7 p.m. on the petition and request of RGS Realty Trust, etc., 164 Kings Highway, Hampton, New Hampshire, under the provisions of the New Hampshire Revised Statutes Annotated, Chapter 231, Sections 160 through 182, inclusive, on the question of the possible removal of a reclosure device installed on the property of Unitel Corporation, poll number 38, located at, in the town of Hamptons, right away at the corner of Kings Highway and 17th Street. Okay. Okay, um, are we going to open it to the public first or? Yeah, right. absolutely. Those wishing to speak, um, would you like to join us at the podium? You have somebody who wants to make a presentation too. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Hi, how are you? <laughs> There's room for another person. You do have two microphones if you need I think I'm the chosen one. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment, first of all, to thank the selectmen, town officials, for giving me the opportunity to express my concerns. And I'd also like to thank Representative Pat Butchway for attending this evening, and of course, all the residents in favor who are here tonight, 20 or so residents of Kings Highway, 17th Street, Green Street, and some surrounding streets that are affected by this. Uh, I was looking over all this information and thinking how I'm gonna present this to to the chairman and the, and, and the selectmen. And today, I noticed reading through chapter 231, <laughs> 231, section 163. It kind of sums up the issue that we're all having, especially myself. And it says, any such licensee or any person whose rights or interests are affected by any such license may petition the selectmen. So that's why I'm here tonight. And briefly, I did go on Fred's advice early on and try to work with Unitil to come to some kind of resolution on this problem and it didn't come. So anyway, you're probably saying, what, what are my, what are my interests? Why are you here, Joe? Why is this so in interesting to everybody? Well, one of the items is my property is affected by this device that they chose to install on that pole. Our house is one of the biggest investments we make in owning a home, especially down the beach. Some of us recently, very close to myself, did a lot of renovations, in turn looking for future returns on these investments. Unitil, by installing this unit, will greatly affect, greatly affect the property values of our homes going forward. Any new buyer will see this monster, I call it, on the telephone pole, and they will, in turn, look the other way, as far as I'm concerned. This is what we're talking about. Now, this unit is installed roughly 34 feet away from my deck. Okay, so this is what this is what we're all here for. This is the actual device. It's called a recloser. I know more about this thing than I ever need to know that I don't want to know. The Unitil educated me very, very much on it. Uh, and any new homeowner coming in to the property, and I was told this by a bunch of local real estate agencies, that the new thing now is they come into homes quite often with these units that are called EMI radiation detectors, looking through 
to see if there's any EMI leakage in a property they're looking for. So any new homeowner that comes in and we try to sell the house and sees that, I mean, of course it's gonna be a concern. And that was not there when we bought the house. There was a pole there when we bought the house. Just a plain pole that had some wires on it. So it wasn't like this was there yeah. when I bought the property. This was added. So anyway, value equates to revenue, taxes, so forth down the road. So if my property is affected by the value, let's say there's a $500,000 price on the house, someone sees this, they may hurt it, it's gonna hurt my neighbor, it's gonna hurt everyone. So, and the second thing was the rights. Unitil kind of deprived my rights to enjoy my property. And they also deprived me the right to have the value of my home is affected by this. So, Again, that's section article 231.163, how I feel it applies to this, this situation we're all here tonight on. And just briefly, Unitil stated at a meeting that this location, this is a meeting we had with Unitil, mm -hmm. I believe the PUC was attended as well. Unitil stated at a meeting that this location was chosen for them because it was an easy installation. It was a clean, basically a clean telephone pole. That's the pole prior to everything, okay? And we're looking at this from a deck in my house. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a closer environmental study should have been done as well as a consulting with the town officials as well as the abutters prior to this massive unit being installed within 30 feet yeah. proximity of some homes. I also feel that the unit greatly affects our property values as I stated earlier. Going forward for visual appearance a very possible, possible, I'm just saying possible, some type of EMI radiation. I did reach out to a company who does this, however, it's, it's a little more complicated and I don't really wanna get into it but I do know that there could possibly be a question about it down the road. Another thing that I looked at is I asked Unitel several times for the locations of the other recloses that are located within Hampton Beach. It, it seems to me that the ones that I found are in totally different locations other than where they are now. There's one I located on Church Street. You got a water tower, looks like a pumping station, and a giant parking lot. No one's homes are gonna be affected by this. I'm sure we all drove by this a million times and never even noticed it. That's again, looking on Church Street. There's another one that I noticed that's out in the marsh area, sort of off of Winnicott Road. Very heavily wooded in that one side, and to the right there's a pretty good piece of property, and then there's an apartment building. Again, it's not nowhere near the proximities of the one located on King's Highway. And this one I thought was pretty interesting. This is out on Route uh, Route 101, kind of where CI's restaurant is. It's uh, sitting out off an exit ramp. Again, there's no houses. There's no, no one that's really gonna be affected by that. If you look at where the one on King's Highway is, it's greatly affected by you can, well that's the pole by itself, but you can envision that unit on that pole. It's so close to all those homes, right underneath it. This unit has basically become part of my house. It's in my living room, basically. So when I sit on that couch, to the right of me is my wife, my dog, and to the left of me is this thing called a reclosa. Every night I gotta see it, every morning I gotta see it. And it isn't just me. The people that are on 17th Street kind of in the front up in this area, they have to look at it. And honestly, I have the best angle of it compared to the people that are on the north or south side because they have to look at this massive structure straight on where I'm looking at it this way. So again, I feel that it was a bad decision on Unitil to put it there. They should have really did some more homework on it, who's it's gonna affect and how it's gonna affect. Another major 
concern we have with this that UNITEL did their best to try to correct was the reflection and the glare that this unit gives off. As you can see in a couple of pictures here, these things that I think they're called NEMA pads, they may be called blades, I'm not really sure exactly, but when the sun hits on these things, they cause a, a very, very bright reflection that literally comes right into my house, and most of all, it's on the deck. So I see this pretty much at sunset, coming down when the sun goes past me. Everyone else to the east will see this in the sunrise. It really affects me when I'm trying to enjoy kind of what I paid for to live at the beach. So as far as my request is just to see if, you know, Unitil could remove this unit, do a further study of a better location to put it, and take it out of my living room, basically. Uh, there's a lot of good with this unit, apparently, from meeting with uh, Unitil and uh, the PUC, uh, and I understand where they're coming from with it, but but even reading through some of their notes tonight, you know, saying that, uh, you know, Kings Highway had the highest uh, level of faults in the system, some, uh, one of the people that's here tonight asked Unitil for a copy of that engineering study, and we never received that with the POC, PUC. We never received that. Uh, another concern was those uh, bl blades that you saw the reflection on. We asked what could be done about that. Unitil made a great attempt to come out and paint it, but they could not paint the pieces that are causing the reflection because they can't. Uh, in this, in this follow back, they never had any kind of insight to it. I myself did a little research on it. I called the manufacturer of the unit. They told me that the blades are made of stainless steel and stainless steel, as we all know, is a pretty good material that's not going to rust. Uh, in the response back from uh, Unitil to the PUC in this follow-up letter, they said that there's a, there's a good possi possibility, I believe they worded in this, that it's going to it's going to dull over time. But you know, what's time? I mean, I've been suffering with this for since it was installed. Uh, Another thing they had said was that, you know, what, what does it service as far as, like, who benefits from this? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're suffering from it, but who's benefited, benefited from it? And we didn't really get that straight answer from that. The only thing that they did say was that it helps with the ability when there's a fault on the line. If we, you know, they can, I'm sure Unitil is going to explain to you a million reasons why it's, it has to be there and why they're good. And they probably do have a purpose. But myself, I mean, I look at King's Highway. There's one tree on King's Highway, because they specified in here that trees, branches could fall on them. Animals can get caught up in the wires, cause a momentary. You finish up so that we can list, have other, hear what other people have to say. You've been talking for 13 minutes. OK. Thank okay. you. Do you have anything other that you'd like to mention? Uh, no, that's pretty much. Pretty much it in, in, a, in a nutshell. If there's anything that comes up after that, would I have the opportunity to? Well, you can probably speak again uh, after everyone's speaking, Mr. spoken. We're, we have Mr. a time to talk Mr. after. Mr. Chairman, may he stay here until the comments are done so he doesn't have to run around? No. He's all set Someone up. Someone else may want to sit there. So there, Unitil is coming. Um, take care of it, Mrs. Walsley. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone um, wishing to speak? Uh, I just have a few minutes. Well, please, yeah, you can speak. As, come on up, join us either at the table or the uh, podium. Is Unitil here? Yes. Sir. Uh, so maybe if you guys spoke next, it might help to. Well, first after of all, this, you didn't come so you could feel sorry for me. Yeah. <laughs> you, Oh, wow. I'd like to just remain seated. You have to either be there yes. or be seated. The and uh, will want to hear. Thank you. Yeah. And, and you have to state your range. name. You have to state your name and address. Is this right? I know it, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. My name is Connie Lema. I live uh, on 
Ocean Boulevard, 887 Ocean Boulevard. In fact, my house was the one uh, that you saw in the photo here, directly in line with the reclosure. Uh, along with what Joe was saying, it bothered me really as an owner and uh, of 23 years at 887 Ocean Boulevard. All of our neighbors and people that we know who have done upgrades to their home have conformed to everything, every permit, everything that they possibly can do to make sure that they're not infringing on their neighbors, mm -hmm. that they're following the rules and regulations of the planning and um, building department. And sometimes it's very difficult. <laughs> sometimes you come across a wall and you just have to work around it. You have to have alternatives. And I hope that the board will look at that. This particular item does not conform to a residential beach property. Mm. We're not all millionaires with mega mansions in that area. We have beautiful homes because we've worked at it. Yeah. And we'd like to continue that look, taking that right away by keeping an item like this really infringes on us, also infringes on the conformity of what we're trying to keep mm -hmm. in Hampton. I will say that uh, I had several complaints, one to Comcast and one to um, uh, Verizon. Um, Comcast tried to get in touch with me several times, but I couldn't get, I didn't get their messages until I was in New York at one point. Mm -hmm. So I never did follow through with them. All they said is they never got in touch with me. However, Verizon did confirm that this reason I wasn't getting text messages and phone calls in my home and around my area, my house, uh, was probably because of the interference of the reclosure, however, they don't have the authority to tell Unitil to take it down, so I have better cell co coverage. However, it was something I had before. It wasn't that I um, had bad coverage before. I had great coverage from Verizon before. Um, so those are points that I wanted to make as a resident and a very distraught resident about this item being put up in my neighborhood. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yeah. <clears throat> he seems to uh, good evening. I, I, um, my name's Tim Healy. I uh, live at uh, One Meadow Pond Road, which is the road that is uh, oh, yeah. parallel to King's Highway. Mm -hmm. And I actually live directly <clears throat> behind Joe, and I have a very clear view of the reclosure uh, right up 19th Street, I mean 18th Street, 17th Street, sorry. <laughs> so um, th that's the reason I'm here. And I, and I agree with Joe, and I'm not going to rehash these things. We did have a meeting on site with Unitil, and I should think they were very accommodating to have the meeting, and they really listened to us, but um, we didn't really get anywhere. But the, the point is, is I don't, I want to make a point that I don't think a lot of thought was about the location. I know how engineers think, and they think, and they just say, oh, that was a good idea. That's a good location. The pole works. Everything else works. And they don't really consider the look at it globally. And I think that's true. I don't know if they'll deny that, but I think it's true, a truism in general. There were other options for this locate, uh, for the, to put a reclosure in. Um, and my biggest suggestion was because they want to protect King's Highway and uh, help with the outages on that, on that, um, in that location. And one of the other locations was possibly the municipal parking lot that is right at the ends of King's Highway. Um, and the, the pole was crowded, as they said, but there was always an opportunity to put in another pole next to it and t have two tandem poles. It happens many times in many locations. So I, I do think not a lot of thought was given to where it was going. Um, I don't necessarily fault them for it, but, um, but the end result is we have something that's really intrusive. I mean, I have the same view of Joe, except it's just 70 feet further away, um, es essentially. So um, it is kind of a large structure that I, I, I think the pitches do do it justice, and I think you should really consider it uh, talking to uh, Unitil and, and um, seeing if we can relocate this. 
I think it's probably a necessary device. Fire department says it's a, it's a safe device. They're not worried about those type of things. They, they stated that clearly. But I think there's some other issues there that need to be addressed. So thank you. Others wanting to speak, would you like to join us, gentlemen, at the table from Unitel to speak? Are you going to make a... Yeah, we can if you like. I think it's a good idea because uh, we'll maybe stop some of the people from coming up twice. Certainly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Selectman, um, members of the public. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. We, we really don't have any prepared statement, um, but we can certainly answer um, any questions that you may have that have been raised by the, the previous speakers. Um, so anything we can do, I, I mean, the, the only thing I would just point out is that the, this, this um, issue was uh, raised and investigated by the Public Utilities Commission staff, and I believe you have a copy of, of the report that, that they issued, and I think it was a, a pretty thorough report trying to look at the, the various concerns that were raised um, about safety, about fire concerns, and, and, and so on. Um, Again, we ha happy to happy to answer any any questions that you have based on the the concerns that you've heard so far. Um, okay, well, uh, I'm I'm going to be wanting to ask them questions, but the, um, we're still open to the public. So, why don't you just stay there and we'll in invite the other people to talk? Because I'm going to have questions. Is that okay, Mr. Walsh? So you're the chairman. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other people wishing to comment? Please come up to the podium. Uh, if there aren't any other people that would like to speak, any other people that would like to speak? Seeing none, yep, you can come up and join us at the podium. Again, thank you. <clears throat> there was a couple things that these fellows had mentioned about the PUC, about their concerns on the safety and so forth. Uh, it, it's, it's a very complicated topic, the safety of it, and myself and the residents feel comfortable with what uh, fire department and the P, uh, PUC came forth with in their investigation of it. Do I agree with it? <clears throat> Absolutely not, but I'm not here to argue that point of the safety of a reclosure. What, one of the things I'm concerned with was in the, in the recommendation on the location of that reclosure, they had stated that there's a lot of outages on Kings Highway. We had asked the PUC for a report, a report of the outage on, outages on Kings Highway, and we never got it. Myself, we were there two winters. Some of these other residents who were here have been there longer. Uh, we never really had any issue as far as power outages going Kings Highway to a point that was like we have to go to a hotel. I mean, they actually did a heck of a good job and during that two years ago storm, I think we were out for probably maybe a couple, three hours at the most part. Have a generator that I bought, I've never even fired it up. It's sitting in the shed. It's going on Craigslist. Another thing too, what they had said was that Kings Highway is very prone to uh, animals, tree branches falling on the wires which sort of makes this reclosure do its do its job, open and close, open and close. Like I said earlier, there's, I noticed one tree on Kings Highway, and I've never seen any squirrels on Kings Highway. I've never seen any bears climbing telephone poles on <laughs> Kings Highway that are going to shot this thing out. Uh, you know, we got, you know, we got seagulls, but they tend mm. to stay on Ocean Boulevard looking for the fish. I mean, I, I don't. Another thing that we asked was the locations of these devices, and we didn't get those. And I was just wondering, there was more slated to go in. They said they were going to be going up somewhere on Mill Road, so on mm. so forth. But again, you can't compare that area to, you know, the close proximity of where we are on Kings Highway. Everything is very close. Every, you know, every all the homes are very tight in that area. So, in, you know, again, just to 
reiterate what uh, you know, Timmy had said, that it, a little bit further studying should have been done of where it's going to go in order to not affect all the residents along Kings Highway. And one other thing that's a little bit disturbing to me was in one of the first meetings that I had with UNITEL, UNITEL sent me an email saying that at this time we do not intend to relocate or remove this recloser and we are paid to do such work. So to me, that didn't set right. You could put something up, but then if I pay you, and a couple of the guys had said between $30,000 to $80,000 to remove this thing, to me that's a form of extortion. You know, mm -hmm. to put this thing up on a pole in front of my house, in my living room, basically, and I invited Unitil on several occasions to come in my house and see this. One of the fellows from Unitil did go up on the deck and look at it. And he had suggested, you know, you know, I suggested, can we move it? We took a ride, well, they took a ride and we went with them and we looked at a couple other locations and I really thought that they would come back with a solution. <clears throat> so. Okay, well, we're getting ready to close this. If anyone else um, wants to speak, now is your time. Seeing none, the um, public uh, part of the meeting is closed at 726. And Mrs. Wolseley, would you like I, to comment? I have a quick question. Uh, is this the one and only public hearing? Yes. It's, this isn't something it's that we have to After hear tonight, for. we'll be taking this under consideration. Right. So it's not the kind of public hearing that we have to keep no. two or three of them. No. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have to say, I agree with the dog. Um, looking out at that thing is... is uh, Looks pretty awful. I'm, I'm glad the pictures came in. Who benefits from this? Why does it have to be in this specific location interfering with the uh, property owners in the neighborhood? Uh, our customers benefit from it. The customers along Kings Highway, all the way down towards the beach area. Um, under other circumstances, um, if Hampton, parts of Hampton Beach were to lose power, we have the capability to utilize this piece of equipment and pick up a lot more customers than, than it currently does. So it has multiple um, benefits. It's the, the core purpose of it is really to improve reliability. Um, as it was mentioned, should there be a temporary fault um, on the line, which could be an insulator that um, tracks over or a bird or a squirrel um, or a limb, although I guess there's not many along Kings no. Highway. I know there isn't. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, what this device does is it will very quickly sense a fault and it will de-energize the line. And then it will take maybe five seconds and close back in to see if that fault is still there. If the fault is no longer there, then everybody remains in power. There's another type of device that would just stay open and not reclose, hence the word reclosure. But, so it, it has a lot of benefits to it, and that's it, I guess, in a nutshell. Why in, why, you have other uh, configurations like this around in the beach. Are you getting complaints on those? Why, okay. why has this been inflicted upon this neighborhood? Yes. Go ahead. If, if I can just say, um, the the location is determined based on an engineering study as to where it gives the most um, the most value in terms of the operation that it does, in in in, in terms of protecting that line um, and trying to re-energize the line after a, a temporary fault, af after something interferes with the line. So it's true that there were, as the gentleman, uh, one of the previous speakers pointed out, some of the other locations yeah. were, were not, uh, were locations not near homes, but they, they weren't chosen because they weren't near homes. They were chosen because of the particular location on that circuit and the most benefit that it will give to the overall circuit. So that's why this location was chosen. 
because of the benefit that it gives overall to to the circuit. Well, it's not giving much of a benefit to the to the uh, immediate property owners. Uh, the, I'm amazed that you can't work something out. Are you, are you planning to put more of these things around the town? Yes. Yes. Are you watching where you're intending to put them? Because you better not be putting them in neighborhoods like this. Um, I, I think this is um, certainly a huge problem for this neighborhood, for property owners, for property values. And I think uh, something uh, certainly should have been worked out. And, and uh, I'm not uh, happy with what I'm seeing here. Ms. Regina? Yeah, I have comments too. I've got the report from uh, you, the PUC, I believe it came from. And Unitil explained the company conducts annual engineering studies of load and reliability. And the increased load in Hampton associated with new construction, remodeling older homes required the company to upgrade High Street and Boys Head substations. According to Unitil, for years, King's Highway has had the highest levels of faults. And I believe that, like it was stated, someone has asked for the engineering report. So I would ask, is that something that we could receive during, I'm assuming we're going to have some type of a we're gonna, time we'll period in between? Two weeks. In okay. two, two weeks, we're going to bring this up again in a meeting. If that could be something that could uh, be given to the Board of Selectmen and perhaps the uh, residents in the neighborhood. And as far as the location of the poll, it's quite intrusive. I'm um, mm -hmm. down in that area quite a bit, and I've been talking with Joe for a few weeks about this. And um, is there any other possible solution that, like someone had mentioned the municipal lot, I know that in your report here, or whoever did this report, it was stated the poll was chosen because it was a clean poll. <laughs> is there any other clean polls around that might not be so neighborhood intrusive? Not without replacing it. So we'd have to replace another poll. Please and no comment from the audience. Maybe two. Um, and as the PUC stated, I think at one of our meetings, it's not fair for all our ratepayers to pay for that. And furthermore, I'm not sure we can guarantee that nobody from, if it were to be hypothetically re relocated to that near the parking lot, it would be right in front of, I think it's called Seacrest Condos. Is that what the name of it is? Ocean Crest. Is oh, where you <laughs> Ocean lived, Crest? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It would be right here. It would be right in front of, be right, right in front right of there. So <laughs> where do we go? I'm not sure. My concern is just for our residents that are unhappy in that neighborhood, and there's quite a few of them here, and I'm sure that mm. there's other people that didn't show up tonight, so I'm glad we're going to have the <coughs> period in between to uh, get more comments in. Yeah. And now we have our resident of Ocean Thank you. Press. Thank you. Yeah, you know, the, the problem is, first of all, it, it's uh, paradoxical or something. When somebody mentioned Verizon, because I can remember a meeting when we put the cells for Verizon on the top of our building with just as many people as here saying they didn't want those cells there. Now I hear somebody saying they've got good service down there with Verizon. So, you know, if you want something, sometimes you gotta, the, the, there's, there are trade-offs and we all want electricity and we all want electricity that's gonna work and we want it safe. And if the fire is determined, the fire department determined in the PUC that it's not a safety issue, that's one thing. The other thing is that there have been issues on King's Highway. I don't know how long you've been there, but I can remember the uh, one big storm when the power was out for four days or so uh, down there on King's Highway. So there have been issues on King's Highway in that whole area that the, that the power has been out for a length of time. I think that the fact is that we really have to investigate this and get more facts and then make a decision, but to not do any decision right now. But the thing is, you know, oftentimes I, I hate looking out my, I mean, I love looking at the ocean out my window, but there's a lot of electrical wires there too. There's a lot, I live right across from the municipal uh, lot. And I, I wish that all the wires were underground. That'd be beautiful and make it much better, but it'd be awfully expensive to do that. So I think there's a trade-off. And I think if you want electricity, you put up with some, things you don't like, mm. you know? I mean, you know, we can all do away with this because we, you know, we can conserve by just not using any. So I think we just need more facts. Okay, 
Um, could you mention how many condos are at Ocean Crest? 34. 34. And Rusty? Yeah, I, I think um, these people bring up a good point that it wasn't there beforehand. <clears throat> but, there's a, again, there's a lot of stuff that's, as, as technology changes and, and stuff like that. Um, so I want, I want to see more information. I want to see, you know, if there are curious, if there are a other areas that it could be. Um, now, th this takes the lines that come down from High Street. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And they, they go, go yeah, down King's yeah. Highway, and King's they also Highway. keep going straight and hang a left north on Ocean Boulevard. Mm. This reclosure doesn't protect those. Correct. It just protects um, it just the vast protects majority King's of King's Highway, Highway south. Correct. So, but I think we, you know, over the next couple of weeks, as we get some more information, I think we'll be mm -hmm. better off to make a determination. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask how many people that are in the audience have come here for this issue tonight, because I presume you're in favor. Um, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, about twelve people. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it is an issue uh, for everybody, and I, I do believe that um, when people buy a house, if they see something like that, they possibly wouldn't buy the house. Um, and then there's other people, and there's a large amount of them, and I hear it all the time, um, about, uh, in fact, from Winniconnet Road to about Little Jacks, all those people that live along there have the wires on their side of the street. Sometimes there might be something in the back. I'm not even sure of that. No, not, they're all on the front. Everybody there absolutely hates it. And, um, and it, even the ones that have lived there for uh, more than 70 years, they hate every one of those wires. And we hear people talk about it. I hear people talk about it all the time. I'm lucky because they somehow they cross the street and either over on the sidewalk on the other side or they're behind me. Mm. And, and I don't know how long it will change before that changes, because with, especially with Little Jacks being turned into a condo. So things do happen. But this is something that people at the beach is absolutely hate these wires. And people that live uh, in, we know from uh, working on changing things downtown Hampton, people hate the wires. But this one is especially big. And one of my questions is, uh, what happens if you don't have it? Things remain the same, and there's the possibility of longer uh, blackouts in the future? Customers will not have automatic restoration. Outages could very well go longer. Mm -hmm. You will not have the ability to tie that circuit, the one along High Street with Hampton Beach circuit. Um, and that does stem back to a, a storm we had probably six or seven years ago. Um, that's basically it. Yeah, I, th I think in, in, the, in the bigger picture, we, we're under what are called service quality guidelines under the direction of the Public Utilities Commission. So we've got, got to show them um, on a regular basis that we're constantly improving uh, service quality in terms of number of outages, duration of outages, um, issues like that. And, and making investments in, into our plan to improve the, the service quality. So this is the type of thing that falls within that. Um, these kinds of devices um, shorten circuits. So a, a circuit that's affected by an outage will, will, would, would be sh shorter. Um, the duration of an outage may be shorter, may be unnecessary to have a long outage. As, as um, uh, my coworker indicated that acts within seconds to try to restore service after there's been some kind of interference with the line. So, so that's, that, that's why you're seeing more of these kinds of devices um, because of both the technology changes and also there's a requirement, as I said, from the commission to, to try to imp improve service quality. There, there's one other issue, if, if I may just address very quickly because I know you want to move on with your meeting. Um, th there was a comment. Uh, uh, about uh, an email that was received where, where we said we wouldn't move it, it uh, w without being paid for it. And, and I understand, and I think maybe we've all been through this, where you get an email and you don't necessarily know the tone that the email was sent and you can read it 
one way and it comes out in a harsh tone. You could read it another way and it's not so harsh. But uh, what I just want to explain is we, we have, we're under particular rules, again, at the direction of the Commission about how we pay for our system upgrades um, and how we recover our costs. And so if we install a piece of equipment and, and, a, and a customer complains and, 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 and a decision is made to move something, unless there's an engineering reason, like if, if, it's, if it's a faulty piece of equipment or it's something that, it, that, it's, um, that isn't working, um, if it's just because, if we're moving something at the request of a customer, then we are required by our tariff to charge that customer for that move. So, so I, I, I just wanted to explain, it's, it's, not, it's not extortion. We're not, we, we didn't suggest that because we're trying to be mean to somebody or obstinate, but, but that's how our system works. If, uh, if we you, understand if here at the board because we have the same issue when we try to give um, senior citizen discounts to Comcast. Everyone else gets charged for it, and we understand that you're talking about if this was to happen, they would it would be all the other taxpayers or ratepayers would have to pay for it. Um, and so I think that's wise that you're taking into consideration all those things. Um, I just wanted to say, too, that I don't think a lot of people realize that as times change, you do change things, because I know that at one time um, where my location is, and there's no trees in Hampton Beach, so it used to be that when you lost electricity, it almost never was Hampton Beach. And if you did lose it, it was gone for a short time. And then somehow, right about from where I am, or probably from Winnicunna, not Winnicunna, um, Boar's Head, they switched everybody on to, I believe it's the same line that's down there on Kings Highway or North Shore Road or whatever. But, and it was during, I noticed it the first time during that storm six or seven years ago. Everyone else had uh, electricity right next uh, door to me, those condos that are at, uh, at Boar's Head at the beginning. Up on Boar's Head, sometimes they had electricity. So th things do change, and they have to make changes, and someone's going to have to suffer. But no one likes to suffer, and I'm glad you, um, you know, take all of these things into consideration, particularly uh, trying to save the rigs payers money. Yeah? May I have a final uh, question? Um, the other... Uh, air, the other items, or whatever you call these things, that that you've placed in the other locations on the beach, don't seem to be interfering with the property owners. It doesn't look like there any there's any glaring or or anything into the properties. Have you had complaints for the other locations? No. And did you? When you thought of locating this particular pole or the stuff on the pole, did anybody take into account, well, I guess you've been over there to see it, too, uh, take into account what it would do to that neighborhood? Uh, I have electrical wires going by my house. There are electric wires all over the town. But they don't glare into the windows. They're not disturbing my property values. They're not intruding on my... Uh, quality of life, and quite frankly, I, I agree with Joe's dog. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Wolseley. I just have Regina. one question. You that doesn't help. You said that um, you have, I know you had one out by Sierra's out on 27. Correct. You have one down on Church Street, which, Correct. like Mary Louise just said, that is less congested. You've, yeah. you've installed one in the middle of one of the most congested neighborhoods mm -hmm. in the whole entire town of Hampton. Yeah. So I understand about all the fees and how if you take it down and you rebuild it, it's going to be charged. But these people have a complaint, and I don't really care what the PUC has to say. Yeah. I'm an elected official, and they're the public that I represent. Yeah. So I would appreciate that um, Unitil could provide a copy of the last engineering study showing that Kings Highway has all these outages. Because like I said, and like Chairman Griffin just said, mm -hmm. up until a few years ago, we hardly ever had any outages yeah. down the beach at all. So why it's happening right now, to me, would be because of the lack of investment yep. in infrastructure all across the board, any type there is. So um, that's something that you have to deal with for electric and gas, and we have to deal with for different things. But um, going forward, I hope that uh, 
Unitil can consider when they, you know, put something like that, a monstrosity, and that's what it is. It affects taxpayers of Hampton, ratepayers that pay the Unitil bill. So no one seems to uh, take that into as much consideration as I would like. You know, you're going to charge ratepayers. Well, ratepayers fund it all, so they always get charged. But you're upsetting a good amount of the neighborhood, and I'm just, it's unfortunate to see and to hear that p p potentially nothing can be done about it. And one more question I wanted to ask is, is there a correlation between Verizon and the reception, like uh, Connie mentioned there, with her text messages and things like that? To our knowledge, no. Um, actually, the, um, there is a communication device on this reclosure, and it's been shut off for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's not even operating. Thank you. And did you gentlemen have anything else to add? And do you gentlemen have anything else to add? Uh, no so we're going to close this meeting, and we are going to take this into consideration, and we will uh, bring it up for a possible motion at our next meeting. Okay, so we're not going to make a decision? No. Yet. And it is 746. Thank you very much. Okay. We appreciate that you came here tonight, and we appreciate everybody came here, especially the pickleball ladies. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so everybody that wants to step outside can. We'd appreciate it because we have a meeting going on. Um, moving on, we are... What did I do with mine? Public comment. Yeah. Any other public comment or any other issues? Yeah, I'd like to make a public comment. Yep. Please join us at the table. But the uh, podium is fine. Uh, my name's Tim Cahill. I'm uh, on the parking subcommittee for Beach Access for Surfrider Foundation in New Hampshire. And uh, I'm an active member of this community, even though I don't live in it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make a public comment about the new business that I see on the list here about it. No parking on both sides of the street for 1st through 19th Street. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say that I think that that is a bad idea and a bad sets a bad precedent for public access to our beaches. Um, I'm the son of an Air Force colonel, and I've traveled all over the world. And uh, I made this my home. And none of my family has made this their home. And um, my best friend lives on 10th Street. And that's where I go for Thanksgiving. And I see this making it that I have to pay to go to Thanksgiving dinner. And I don't think that's a good idea. You know, there's plenty of homes on those streets where people use those parking for their friends and family when they, when they visit. And I just think it would be a bad idea. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. Any other um, comments? Let me see your agenda. Please join us if you want to. Mine's right here. I'll find it in a minute. My name is uh, Chris Grippo. I'm a Hampton resident. I live on uh, Cranberry Lane. Um, um, I want to make a comment on this parking issue on, um, on streets 1 to uh, 19. And again, uh, I also believe it's a it's just a bad precedent. I mean, everyone is here to enjoy the beach regardless of your activity. Mm -hmm. And there's already parking challenges with the limited number of parking meters. It's only going to cause a further problem. Even on my street on Cranberry, we have public parking. I've lived there for five, five years. I have only seen two issues in five years, and it's been quite busy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, People are respectful. People know it's a privilege, uh, and I would hate to see that privilege taken away because it's only going to create strain in other places. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for coming in this evening. Rick, Anyone else? I'd like to speak. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Sean Gula. I currently live on 8 Gray Avenue in Hampton. Uh, formerly used to live on 13th Street mm -hmm. uh, for three years. And I'd like to comment on the parking issue. Um, as, uh, as a person who feels incredibly blessed and privileged to live in this town, um, I think it's a bad idea to limit access for people that may live 
out of the area or just out of town away from the beach a little bit. Um, I think it's a wonderful kind of a locals spot to park. I've, I've never seen any issues when I've lived down there. In fact, I've met some of my best friends that have parked out in front of my house and everyone's really respectful. And I think that um, as, as far as any safety concerns for um, banning parking there, I think the denser parking in that area actually slows traffic down and I know studies have shown that. So I just think it's, it's a really, if, if Hampton wants to become um, an attractive place for people to, working professionals to live and work. I think providing access to the ocean is a key element in that. And if you restrict that, you're gonna stifle Hampton's economy and growth and just um, just general good vibes. I, I just think it's it's a great thing to, to keep that sort of parking and have access for all. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Please join us. Donna Kenna. I'm on 16th Street, and I didn't know we were going to have this conversation today, so I didn't really have anything prepared. Uh, I have issues with people parking on 16th Street because they park on my lawn. They park in front of my post box so I don't get my mail. Um, so it's frustrating to me to have people out of the area that have no concern about the property that they're parking on. So that's my fear, or my, I guess my, not my fear, but my statement is, I, I don't know if the, the conclusion or decision would be not to have parking at all, but maybe there be some kind of consideration for people so that they're not parking on my lawn and not in front of my post office box so that I actually can get my mail. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say something back on the public hearing, just in case anybody, you know, has any question. I'm going to remove myself totally from any discussion on that since it would affect me if it moves there. Mm -hmm. So I won't be involved at all in any of the discussion or any of the voting. Thank you. I just want to make that known so anybody, you know, they don't have any questions going forward. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else wishing to speak during public comment? Mr. Griffin, do you want me to hang around for the discussion on the parking issues on North Shore, or would you like me to do it at public you can do it at public comment if you'd like. Yeah, there's no sense yeah. of waiting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, feel free. The thing is, um, we're, this is going to be one of those things when we do talk, we won't be making any decisions this evening. So yeah, people are going to. advise that strongly. Um, yeah, is people yeah. are going to be able to have uh, two weeks. On this thing, uh, this parking situation, we're going to give them a month to. Uh, to put forward letters or whatever. That would be great so we can yeah. be on the summer season yeah. so we have a little more time to That's focus right. on that with everything else we have going on. Okay. The North Shore parking, uh, as we know, has been an ongoing issue. Um, hmm. While I understand uh, the lady that just spoke, her concerns, uh, currently now there is no law against parking in front of a mailbox, believe it or not. That, that's not a uh, prohibition of parking. Yeah. Um, sure. And I've listened to the gentlemen speak about their concerns about having access to the, the ocean and, and things like that. I would say this. I would not support right now a total prohibition of parking on those streets. I think we can find, you know, try to find a way in the middle. The problems we're running into a lot of the times on some of the streets, and the gentleman mentioned 10th Street, when you pull down some of these streets, what we're encountering is folks over the years, nothing nefarious here, but they've encroached out into the public ways. So when people say they're parking on my yeah. lawn, yeah. yes, it's a part of the lawn you're maintaining, but if you look down the street as to where the phone poles are, yeah. most of those cars are parking actually in the right of way. Now, many people have gone to the extremes of trying to prevent that from happening by putting obstructions out into the right of way, including, you know, vegetation, plants, uh, plant boxes, uh, yeah. a number of items have gone out there. What I would hope we could do is look at a way to try to get folks down there if we could just clean up some of the areas where people have trying to kind of taken over the, the right of way mm -hmm. and paved next to their house and now claim that as their parking. That's a constant issue, mm. okay? So we have to make a decision as to where we want to, what level do we want to go with this? I mean, as we did the project down at the beach, as you recall, there were people that had encroached out into the public ways and there had to be some adjustments made to the property lines to make that construction work. 
And then when we did the uh, leaded streets, we put in nice sidewalks and curbs, and it was pretty clearly defined where you could and couldn't park. Mm -hmm. Somehow up on the North Shore, if we could get to that, because it, it makes it very hard for the officers and the parking enforcement folks to go up there and do their job effectively, only to come back and find out that somebody had something from the planning board or there was some other right to park where they were, which if you looked at it, it appears to be a parking violation. I think if we could clean those issues up, we could keep the one-sided parking. Things like, let's get everybody to move their mailboxes on the side of the street that people aren't allowed to park on. Let's get people to put their trash receptacles on the one side of the street that is no parking allowed. Something along that line so we don't, I, I, I agree with the gentleman, I don't want to see a loss of parking on the North Shore. We've already lost enough. And I don't think that's going to help anybody's efforts to make it a desirable place to be or live or to visit, so. Yeah. Now, ordinarily, because um, you are speaking during public comment, we don't um, uh, have questions. But I think because you're going to be getting ready to leave, that maybe we can open this up to the board. Does everyone agree with that? That we help? Sure. Yeah. Agree that to allow us to ask questions of the chief where it's public comment? Did you have a problem with it, Mrs. Wilson? Well, I think you should have an, an actual appointment if we're going to discuss this, but I don't, if there's No, we it are now, discussing it tonight. If they're studying it now, I don't have The reason why we're asking this is he wants to leave. There is someone that's yes. going up and discuss it. So would you like to ask him no, any questions? I said, I'd Regina? rather he came back. I, I was going to ask the fire chief, but since you're here, I'll ask you. Is there any, this is from a uh, resident, is there any rhyme or reason to the sides of the street between 1st and 19th that you can and can't park on? Yes. When that first was enacted, um, the fire chief and I went around and the deputy police chief, uh, Dave Hobbs, who was a sergeant at the time, and then this all started when Jamie Sullivan was the chief. So as, I, as the deputy, I went around uh, with Chief Ayotte and we kind of just tried to look at Looking at the streets, and because of the issues I've raised about people kind of have taken it over for their own parking, what would be the, you know, our, some of our logic was, okay, what's the best way to get apparatus down here so that if a ladder had to go up, we're not running it into a pole or wires. Um, and the other thing we were looking at is if some of the streets have been so taken over by that encroachment into the right of way that by putting parking on that side of the street, you were essentially eliminating parking on that street. Mm -hmm. Because when you drive down some of these streets with the way people have paved, it looks like it's their private property when it's really not. <laughs> when you like you go down um, 7th Street, when you turn on the 7th Street, it looks like that's a person's driveway. No, I've had to speak with a resident a couple of times about mm, your cars really can't be there because it's on the no parking side. But when you look at it, it's paved and it appears to be their driveway when it's really not. Um, and that's part of the problem we have to deal with is there's so much encroachment that has gone on over the years. So that's on the side where the people aren't supposed to park? Yes. And you, you see that you regularly frequently. ticket those cars? We don't because it's hard for the officers when they go out there not knowing, not having a plot plan in front of them to understand whether that's public domain or private property. So yeah. it's, that's the problem with those, those streets is how do we address that? And the other thing is... Yeah. Whatever we do, we do have to improve the signage because we have a sign at the top of the street and a sign at the bottom. And it really, we have to make it very clear that the entire length of the road is a fire lane. We've written tickets in those areas, and people look at those little boxes, the 10-foot boxes at the corners, and they think that's the fire lane, when they don't realize the entire length of the street is the fire lane. Mm -hmm. So we have to do a little bit better job of our own with the signage, the markings, but really looking at the encroachment that has occurred so we can at least gain some of that parking back. Okay. I think if we were able to accomplish that, we wouldn't have to eliminate parking uh, mm. as an entirety on, on those streets. Yeah, because that, that there is something that's blatantly unfair. First of all, the people shouldn't have paved that property. Second of all, uh, why are they not being ticketed? If, they, if they're on the wrong side of the street. I think that whatever comes of this is, because this is, you know, us even asking these questions, uh, which we are here tonight because there's a gentleman that had a problem, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, but this happens every year, and I think we certainly have to make it somewhat stronger, but I think that we need to make sure that these laws are, are enforced and people not uh, like the lady that spoke, I don't know what her situation is, but everybody does think that they own the land when they don't. 
And um, the town, I'm sure the town position is always affected because we could go in there and um, change everything, but it would cost a great deal of money. Yes, it would. But it sounds to me like it's going to be worth the money to put the right signage and make sure the people are all treated. If they're, if they're not supposed to park there, they need to be ticketed. Uh, but uh, what is your opinion of all of the people that put those big rocks and uh, there are people that actually even put fake mailboxes up, hoping to stem the flow of people parking there. So, you know, it's pretty bad. And I hear these comments all the time. Um, but then people also uh, get upset when you have to remind them that once there's no parking there, they can't use it either. Well, that seems to be, you know, parking issues throughout the town. You know, we had the issue down on Harris Ave, if you recall. People were upset about some of the local workers at the beach coming down there and taking those spots, mm -hmm. and we, just had, we had to remind them that th that is, although it's out in front of your house, that's public property, it's not yours. You know, you, you're not exclusive to that parking spot, it's not yours. Mm -hmm. So if somebody parks there and they park there legally, it's, it's nothing we, we can do about it. It got to the point on several streets, uh, we've seen people put up their own no parking signs along the street. I had counted that one time on 6th Street where I called Public Works, and I happened to be parking on 6th Street, um, and a gentleman come out of the house to tell me I couldn't park there. I says, I'm pretty sure I can. Um, that's not a town sign. I go, somebody else put that up there. This side of the street is legal to park on, and I might have a little intuition on that one. So, you know, we had to Public Works. So when I see illegal signs mm -hmm. posted on the public way, I do have Public Works come down and remove them. Mm -hmm. I would remember the, I would remind the public, not that we're out there looking to enforce this heavily, but people put up signs on their private property, face towards the street to give the indication that they can't park in front of the house. Those are a violation of town ordinance. We can summons them and have them removed. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do that. I just ask if you, if you have a parking issue, please don't put your own signs up. It, it is illegal. It's a violation mm -hmm. of town ordinance. Yeah, I would, if, for, if it was up to me, I would be up to uh, going there and removing any of these things out of the public way, uh, whether they're rocks or whatever, because it really isn't fair. Um, Mr. Waddell. Uh, we're not doing, we're going to discuss this. Do you have any questions for the chief before he, no, we haven't even, the gentleman hasn't got up to, yeah. No, yeah. No. No. Okay. Anyone else a question for the chief? The chairman is available to be deputized for this. <laughs> it's not a job Sorry, you want. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next, we have announcements and community calendar. Done. Regina? Um, just that. I bought my tickets to the pig roast. Oh, That's coming I up in a couple post. weeks. And we were um, poor pig. talking about up at stairs at Experience Hampton. There, um, the pig roast has donated 20 tickets for the uh, Navy committee. So hopefully those guys will come and have a good time and be in the community. And also, um, I guess that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Waddell. Yeah, if you noticed in the paper and uh, that the lifeguards down at Hampton Beach won the contest down there, which they've done many years in a row, I think. And I think we're lucky to have probably the best trained and the best uh, operated lifeguard service in the country, I would say. So I think it's a uh, kudos to those guys for the good job <clears throat> that they do down there. Yeah, they look like nice kids, too. Yes. Uh, it's nice to have people that are, work so hard and try to excel. I think Jimmy Donahue will appreciate you calling him a nice kid. Ah, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's older than I am. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but. Next, we have approval of minutes to uh, will, July 29. I will so move that we approve the minutes of July 29 to, to 2019. I have uh, edits for the minutes. Um, Number one, bottom of page five, Selectman Barnes, I read a letter. I just wanted to somehow clarify that the letter that I read was uh, in regards to an email from Mike Carl, Chief Operator of the Wastewater Treatment Plant, in regards to his concerns about PFAS regulations and the impl implications to the wastewater treatment plant upgrades. And also on number two, I recused myself prior to the end of the non-public session. Therefore, the motion to go back to public seal and adjourn should be a 3-0 vote. Okay, uh, so did we have a second for? Um, I'll second it. Yeah. 
first and a second. All those in favor? Unanimous. So we're not going to do my edits? No, with oh, your edits. I thought that, oh. I thought that was with your edits. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought okay, you were talking you, about. Was that your motion? What? Yes. With my edits? I didn't. Uh, all I did was to move, to move the approval. Do you agree to my edits? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Then I'm in favor. Oh, thank okay. you. So that's a 5-0. Um, next, we have the consent agenda. It's cemetery deeds uh, 16... Um, P Street. P Street. Uh, parade and public gathering license uh, for smutty this nose. smutty Mrs. Wolseley I can read well, smutty nose smoke show barbecue number four roast closure permit number five unitil gas line petition number six USS Virginia committee and I would like to uh, hold the uh, Parade and public gathering license, because I, th this is the one where we've had the complaints about the, uh, uh, which I'm going to address under uh, new or old business, about um, there was a, evidently a concert there, and do we know what this is all about, Mr. Welch, the Smutty Nose Smoke Show? I shall endeavor to find it in the record. Because we have had several <clears throat> complaints calling. We have. We have. The barbecue, um, raise money for a charity. It does not indicate from what I can see here that they're going to have entertainment. But I suspect that may be the case. So there's no entertainment license here, or do they work see on this? an entertainment. I have a gathering license, liability insurance, uh, I don't see an entertainment license, Mr. Chairman. Well, maybe this is something we could ask the chief because he's here now. There have, right, yeah, the there's been um, complaints about Smutty Nose. Uh, they must have had a concert or something. Saturday there. night they did. Saturday yeah. night yeah, they did. What can you tell us about that? I I haven't had a chance to speak to anybody because I have been on some days off. Um, I only came back for this meeting tonight, so I haven't had a chance to speak directly to anybody but the deputy chief. My understanding is we get the noise complaints. Um, that the there was three detail officers working that event. Uh, they were contacted. That I understand the music was turned down to some degree. Uh, the lieutenant went up, uh, who was overseeing the shift, made a determination that the sound on its own was not unreasonable, uh, but no measurements were taken at that particular time. The lieutenants are pretty attuned to noise levels, uh, but any future complaints, I'll direct that measurements be taken. This is kind of a new phenomenon out there. They haven't had a big show of that nature. This was their first big event. The other events that they have uh, are out on a patio, and it's usually a guitar player, uh, some reggae music, and they're done very early in the evening. So I think this is the first one that went beyond 7 or 8 o'clock at night. So. And do you know anything about this uh, smutty smoke show? This, uh, I believe this is an event they've had in the past. They've had some folks uh, sit as judges. I've been asked to sit as a judge on the on the barbecue eating, so I don't know why they would pick me. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so this, I believe, this is an event they've had in the past. Okay. It and goes there from, has not been any problem. It goes that. from two to six p.m., sir. Oh, okay. Okay. Most of the events out there have been earlier timed events. They're done either early. They mm -hmm. do road races, and they're done early in the day. Uh, I know they've increased the entertainment they've had out there uh, with the reggae out in the back on the patio, but they're done early in the evening. So this event the other night was the first one that was later into the evening, and I believe they were done at 10 o'clock. Thank you very so that's much. That's the knowledge I have of it. Yeah. And what is your pleasure, Mr. Chairman? Do you want three taken out or left in? No, I'm fine. Did you have any questions for the no, chief? No, I have. Is anyone else? I have a okay. motion to uh, Thank you. approve the consent agenda, uh, pointing out that under item four, it should be St. Cyr Drive. There's a typo there. I'll second. All those in favor, unanimous. Uh, our first appointment tonight is Chief Ayotte. <laughs> And Deputy Chief. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, good evening, and members of the board. Thank you again for allowing us to come in and talk to you. 
the summer season has arrived. And uh, since our last visit, we've had many changes in our ranks. Deputy Justin Cutting has been busy working to consolidate some outstanding issues. Some of them are, have included our pump testing, annual pump testing, completing some vehicle maintenance tasks, and he's been very busy issuing structural firefighter gear to the entire department. As you are aware, the voters were exceptionally kind and allowed for the purchase of a complete second set of gear for all members. Mm -hmm. All of the gear has arrived, been catalogued, and has been distributed. I want to thank the Town of Hampton residents. They have helped us become a safer workplace. Their involvement cannot be overstated. We really appreciate it. <coughs> Captain Sean Gannon began his first shift on Group 2 on the 4th of July and Lieutenant Buck Frost on the Sunday prior. I'm pleased to report that they are doing very well. In fact, Lieutenant Frost has already responded to his first fire as a new lieutenant. He was first due to the Royal Crest Motor Inn and did an exceptional job. Captain Gannon, not his first fire as a company officer, but as a captain, on August 7th, he responded to the Exeter Road fire. We fielded 2,727 calls for service through July 31st, 2019. There were 1,307 fire calls and 1,420 EMS runs with 1,416 patient contacts. This is a 6% increase in fire calls and a full 10% increase in EMS calls for service over last year. On the fire side, in the last quarter, we have responded to 687 fire calls. This includes four structure fires in Hampton, four outdoor grass fires, and three vehicle fires. One, on a, uh, one fire on powered electrical equipment up against an outdoor building, and a chimney fire at a local restaurant. On May 25th, a small fire at Shirts R Us on Ocean Boulevard was extinguished. On May 26th, an outdoor fire with extension to the main building occurred at Sea Spiral Suites. On June 17th, crews responded to a fire at Community Oven. The hood suppression system had knocked down the fire and the firefighters ventilated the building. On July 9th, the fire at the Royal Crest Motor Inn on Ashworth Ave damaged several units. On July 15th, crews extinguished a fire in an outdoor piece of equipment on Ashbrook, Ashbrook Drive, adjacent to an outdoor shed structure. On July 27th, the fire occurred on the third floor of a single family home on Dover Ave, which caused exposure damage to two other structures. In the last quarter, we responded to Brentwood, Exeter, Epping, and twice to Northampton as mutual aid for structure fires. Fire remains a great threat in the United States, as there have been 1,249 fatalities nationwide since the beginning of, year, of this year, and that number has not been updated. I know that you've all seen what's gone on in Pennsylvania with the five fatalities for children yeah. this weekend. We received mutual aid 17 times since May 1st and responded to other communities six times for fire calls. Stated another way, we requested mutual aid almost three times more than we provided it. The first week of July was a busy time at Hampton Fire Rescue as we were preparing for and conducting operations on the 4th of July. The following week, we had 20 firefighters complete grant-funded rescue boat operator training and 15 firefighters complete rescue swimmer class. 13 of those completed both classes. Marine One has responded to several calls for assistance. Two were in Rye. One was for an overturned kayaker that was approximately one mile offshore. We also responded to a boat taking on water at the marina. Mm. The boat ultimately sank tied up against the dock. No fluids were leaking, and all the appropriate agencies were contacted, including the U.S. Coast Guard and the Department of Environmental Services. In the emergency medical services side of the house, the EMS numbers are cumulative for the year from January 1st through July 31st. We responded to 1,416 patient, well, we had 1,416 patient contacts since the beginning of the year. There were 895 transports to various hospitals. We transported to the Exeter Hospital 406 times, Portsmouth Regional 267 times, Seabrook ER 204 times, and the Anna Jakes Hospital 18 times. Of the 2019 calls for service, 39 have been for overdose. Hampton Fire Rescue administered Narcan 31 times this year. Unfortunately, the decline I reported on in the first quarter has disappeared, and we are now seeing higher numbers than last year for overdose. We responded to five STEMIs which you'll recall is a ST elevation MI or a heart attack, 14 patients having stroke, 19 chest pain calls, 15 cardiac arrests, and 240 trauma patients. Falls remain the highest cause of trauma. The Community Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation, or CPR, and first aid training, along with the National Stop the Bleed program, um, our classes continue to be well attended. Additionally, I want to pass on that EMS officer, Nate Daniel, has changed all of the batteries in the AEDs located on the town property. We hope that they are never used. Mm. The rescue task force training that took place on May 11, we had discussed that one time. This training was practical evolutions that brought the EMS providers into a simulated warm zone. This training was a collaborative effort between Hampton, Fire Rescue, Hampton Police, SAU 90, and I would like to thank Chief Sawyer, Deputy Hobbs, Superintendent Murphy, and Principal Costa for the, helping make this possible. 
As you'll recall, the equipment necessary to provide medical attention to the victims of violence included bulletproof vests, helmets, eye protection, and other components specific to dealing with trauma patients. We were able to purchase four sets of equipment last year through the New Hampshire Department of Homeland Security grant that you helped us obtain. This training completed the grant requirements. This training also demonstrated that four sets was inadequate. I have authorized the purchase of three more sets and they have been ordered. We participated in the Water Safety Day in late July that was initiated by our very own lifeguards, the New Hampshire Department of Natural Cultural Resources lifeguards, the award winners, in conjunction with the U.S. Coast Guard and several other agencies. We brought CPR instruction to the sand and it was very well received. We also participated in Lane Memorial Library Touch a Truck, which was also very well received. I want to close this section by informing the board that we posted openings for paramedic school and only had one member respond. Wow. They asked to defer to the spring class when another member is hoping to attend using the GI Bill. As I have stated to you before, paramedic school is a major commitment and undertaking for anybody. It is made less stressful if there's a classmate that is with you that you can help um, with studying and that you already know so you can share information and partner with. If the board so chooses, at the conclusion of the report, I would recommend and humbly ask that you allow this deferment. We need, our, to, we need to develop our ranks, and I believe that investing in this education will be one of the most beneficial things we can ever do for the department and for the community. Mm. For fire prevention, the Fire Prevention Bureau has performed 117 inspections, issued 63 permits, and collected $1,301 in fees in the last quarter. In a year-over-year -year comparison, 2019 and 2018 are indistinguishable. Both numbers are almost exactly the same. Mm. I'm pleased to report that the final class provided by the New Hampshire Fire Marshal's Office occurred on August 8th. These training sessions were an amazing success. We filled the room with fire prevention and building inspectors from across the state. Great. We have five more display fireworks shoots scheduled, and that includes Seafood Fest and New Year's Eve. Communications side, our fire alarm operators have answered 6,719 phone calls in the last quarter. As I have stated above, several of these were for fires, which then they must also dispatch and coordinate radio traffic. We have completed all of the work outlined in the FY17 Assistance to Firefighters grant. All pagers have been issued, the obsolete Spectrum mobile radios were replaced, the main base radio was replaced with new technology, and a transmitting radio was installed at the beach station. We worked with FEMA to amend the grant, the original grant, when we found that the process had supplied four additional radios for mobiles that were not needed, and we were able to purchase four portable radios, and these should arrive next week. We have a few problems with the existing fixed sites, and we have a preventative maintenance visit that occurred last week. We're waiting on the report, which actually we, we received that in the last two days. One area of concern is the power output on the transmitter located at the Falcone Circle water tower. We'll address this as soon as we find the root cause. Under administration, we're working to update several key documents in the department. This includes rules and regulations as well as some outdated standard operating procedures. Mm. This is a time-consuming process that requires vigilance. We're working to prepare for the Seafood Fest, and we are working collaboratively with the Hampton Police Department, New Hampshire Fire Marshal's Office, New Hampshire State Parks, and the Hampton Chamber of Commerce to ensure that this event is safe and enjoyable for all of the guests. We're continuing to work to make the department more efficient. One area that we hope to assist us in this process is the Red NMX software package that will replace IMC. I'll ask Deputy Cutting to provide some information on this transition. As a part of the purchase of this software, um, it included about 50 hours of training it included about 50 hours in, of training and support as a part of the purchase for this software. And to use that most efficiently, what we're working on now is getting all of our staff familiar with the, with the software itself. So that time is spent really drilling down on details. Um, within the assigned areas of responsibility, the officers and the administrative staff are reviewing the modules that apply to them. Um, and they're creating summaries that identify any problems that they identified. Um, any proposed solutions, an overall assessment of how it's going to meet the goals of the department, um, and then any resources that they'll need to fully implement those modules. Um, and they're also creating workflow documents uh, identifying the, the sequential steps that it will take um, to make this operational. So we're also, uh, the final thing is working with the vendor, um, hoping to begin training in September, starting with the computer-aided computer dispatch portion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. As was discussed earlier during public comment, Hampton remains a vibrant community. It's still growing, and I have reported to you in the, uh, that the community has added lots of real estate in the last few years. This demonstrates the draw that this beautiful town provides. Last year, I talked about adding 1.4 million square feet of real estate. 
I will tell you that this has been eclipsed by the construction that's ongoing now and planned projects that are slated to begin mm -hmm. soon. We're seeing a growth that is bringing a historically seasonal population into a year-round residential situation. Former hotels are being rebuilt as taller structures with year-round apartments. A seasonal restaurant will soon become a four-story structure with 30 units. Mm -hmm. There are also several new neighborhoods that are being built in the town. While we work to improve the department incrementally, Hampton is growing exponentially. Yeah. In conclusion, there's a lot of summer left. We're happy to see the visitors in the community, and we want them to have a safe and enjoyable visit. Thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mrs. Wolseley. Chief, I'm going to say to you what I say every time you do your quarterly report, outstanding, and I really appreciate it. But I'm not trying to be mean to you when I ask you, please, to forward to the chairman of the budget committee by email a copy of your report so that he can share that with the whole yes, committee. Uh, and uh, outstanding job. Thank you. Thanks. Gina? Yeah, thanks for the report, Chief. On that, I'm sorry, the overdoses, did you yes, say they were up? So initially, if you remember back May, I believe it was May 6th that I sat in front of you and I told you that the first quarter we saw a decline. And if, if memory serves, and it is memory, so please, um, I think we only had 10 at that point. And I say that, I don't mean to demean any of them. but. 10 overdoses as compared to where we were last year, I, and I don't have the numbers direct, um, it was significantly less. If I'm not mistaken, it was somewhere in the, in the area of about a two-thirds decline. Okay. Uh, we have since now seen a rebound. We've been doing a lot more overdose in the last uh, quarter, and we've actually seen it come to beat last year's. In a race, again, that I keep telling you that we don't want to win, it seems that uh, we are surpassing last year's numbers. That's very unfortunate to hear. It is. Um, and there's, we don't know what. Okay. The root cause of that, no. However, I can tell you that right now the fire department is working um, with the, the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we're going to come before the board shortly to discuss the possibility of deploying something called a SAMHSA grant, um, which is going to enable us to provide services following a situation where somebody may have overdosed, where we're able to provide information to the, the resident and or the family members that, that may be affected. How many of these are people from Hampton that actually live here? I don't know that, sir. I think the number is about 45% of them. 45% are residents of Hampton. Sure. Thank you. I'm glad that you're looking at things like that. Um, and the other question I have is I sympathize with you on the 1.4 thousand million. million square feet. Yeah. Um, so but it would be nice. Year. I'm hoping that in this whole master plan process that the planning board started putting together that maybe all this can get incorporated into what all this development does to mm -hmm. our infrastructure, which obviously is our major departments like fire police and public works Agreed. because we haven't really invested too much in any of those in my opinion and also I just wanted to um, say publicly a special thanks to our Nate Denio for his assistance on Friday Excellent. truly appreciated he was right there when we needed him Excellent. so thank you okay and Mr. Waddell good report thanks, sir. and it's great to see all the training going on I think that's super I think the super I think the uh, the rescue swimming and the boating and stuff, I mean, since we are in a marine environment, it's really great and great to see the paramedics and stuff. I mean, we're, we're probably, like our police department and everything else, probably one of the best trained departments in the state, and I think that's great. I think, you know, as we're looking at all this growth and stuff that you're, you, that you're continually working on organization and plans for the future and what, what you need to do as a department to keep up with the growth, what you need to do, go to the public and warn articles and stuff to increase what you need. And I yes, think, sir. you know, we got to stay on top of that. And I'm, I'm sure you guys are. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You say you've had some pretty busy days this summer. We have. And uh, you guys have done an excellent job. Thank you very uh, much. You, you've been under some extenuating circumstances with limited manpower. And uh, uh, you have many people down there that showed a lot of chutzpah. So Good word. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for um, doing everything that you do. Um, one of the questions that um, has been asked of me, and I, I wasn't absolutely positive that I had the right answer, uh, what is the policy about having um, grills on the decks of places? Is it different if it's a, 
if you live, if you own the home, you can evidently do what you want. But whatever, if it's a multi-unit, so um, historically, no propane grills are allowed. Uh, propane can't be transited through the house. You couldn't carry a 20-pound propane tank through the house. People would leave it at the back door. It becomes a fire hazard. Uh, additionally, propane tanks and, and other, doc, uh, other um, parts, components of the grill are, are a huge fire hazard to be leaving in that area. Uh, the fire marshal's office does have a uh, bulletin that they had put out that discussed electric grills. And they have since done away with that because any type of um, cooking appliance that may result in a flare-up where the fire, if you're cooking hamburger, and you, instead of sometimes my wife buys 93%, you don't get flare-ups with that. But if you're cooking a 75% hamburger, you get a good flare-up, and that, that fire can raise up. If there's a deck above you or if there's a roof above you, soffit, something like that, that fire can enter the structure. So it's, uh, it's now not allowed by the state fire marshal. to Or multi-units. Right. So single-family homes, we have no purview by state law, um, one- and two-family homes, but it's highly recommended that they don't. Yeah. And so I just want to make it clear again, does that, that there shouldn't be any um, electric grills on the decks either? Correct. I do believe, and Mr. Waddell will bring up your site again, I think that um, we, we paid a visit through fire prevention to your location, and we had a couple of grills removed from the decks. We discussed an outdoor grilling area um, on the property, on the site, but not no longer on, a, on the deck. So how did you find out about that? Was there a fire? At uh, actually, I think the fire prevention officer was driving by yeah, and also I think it's when we redid the sprinkling system. Uh, additionally, right, we, yeah. we did that on the exterior, right? Yeah, that he was down there looking and said, no, no. Right. So no. was that a multi-unit that caught fire? And was Which there one? the one down on, is it Dover Ave? Dover Ave was a single family home. Single Third family floor. home. Yes. Yeah. But they did have a deck, go I mean, a um, grill going? Yeah. There was no grill. There was no evidence of a grill. Hmm. I did the investigation, and I, I also worked with the... Um, the EFI Global representative, who was their insurance company representative, and um, the fire is undetermined. But I can tell you that there was no evidence of any type of grill on the deck at any time. Um, so that was certainly not part of our equation. No, I can tell you it definitely can happen. Uh, about 20 years ago, I thought I was getting um, broken into. And I got on the phone and called the police and said, someone's trying to break into my apartment, and it was the fireman because I had left a, the deck, my grill. I had a little hibachi there, and I put it out, and I would have never guessed in a million years that it could have caught fire again. There was barely right. anything in it, and it was five hours later when it, sure. it built up a little air underneath it and caught my deck. And that's all it takes. And I've talked to you before about um, the wind-driven fires, right? So those embers can sit for a long time, and then if, it, if somebody goes to bed and it's now 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and the winds stir, then we potentially have a wind-driven fire when nobody's around to notice it and extinguish it quickly. We have other considerations in a larger fire usually. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Mrs. Wolsey really has one quickly, more question. Thank you for the update on the uh, oil and the fueling on the pier. That was, that was very interesting. It never occurred to me. But thank you for that. That's very good information. Yes, ma'am. And that do, is the that do you is. Want to elaborate on that? Well, there's there's been some discussion. There's there's two uh, instances here to talk about. One is the over the water fueling. There's a vessel that's requested um, a permit for over the water fueling. Um, only Atlantic Fuels is currently permitted to allow um, large large uh, volumes of diesel fuel to go over the water. Um, the state pier has uh, fueling stations, and these are under the purview of the the. Um, the mechanical inspectors from the state. And we had a conversation about this because there was questions about what had happened at the weirs. The weirs situation was a little bit different than what we have experienced. Uh, it may have been some operator error on the boat operator. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's conditions that, that are, um, not to say that they won't happen here, but they, they're certainly watched a lot closer at the state pier. Um, we also have Deputy Chief Mike Matthey from the fire marshal's office is involved and he's coming down he's been dealing with gina marconi mm -hmm. to investigate and inspect the the pier are you talking about the person that's complaining that there's some issue there so been a gentleman sending picture about uh it looks like a uh what i know it to be is fueling i didn't know there was there was another picture that was associated with that well, it looks like a picture of someone that's got like a thing at a gas station sitting on the um, pier. Mm. I've told them that it is a state issue. It is, and, and the fire marshal's office is investigating that. Mm. Okay. Great. That one, I, I did talk to Chief Matthew about that. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for coming in tonight. Absolutely. We appreciate it. You do have All one piece you of do. business. Uh, did you want us to do anything about that question you asked about the paramedic? Sure. 
Why don't we ask that question? Yeah, why don't we do that right so now? So I have a paramedic who is, in, or I have an AEMT who is interested in going to paramedic school. I also have another firefighter who has expressed interest in going to paramedic school. Mm -hmm. However, they're looking to go in the fall. Um, the person who has applied and asked for permission to go on behalf of the fire department has requested a deferment to the spring class as opposed to the November class. So with your indulgence, I would love to send them to paramedic school. Uh, when in the spring? Yeah. Okay. So, do you need us to do something here? You've today? already accepted the idea of sending two, and um, mm -hmm. you lot up to forty-five thousand dollars is what the budget was for, yeah. for sending them to school. Um, it, interestingly, we won't need all of that money because at the end of the day, um, the one of the candidates that's potentially going wants to use GI Bill. He's looking to ex exhaust that, and so that's his decision. Um, but in order to allow them to attend together I think that it would be in the best interest of us and of them to to do so in the springtime okay I'll make a motion to uh, allow the chief to set up the program where Second. they send them in the, yep. in the spring instead of this fall yeah. where is school um, Manchester oh excellent. okay so we have a first we have a second all those in favor Wonderful. unanimous there is one more point of business yeah. I think I'm right to pass on the agenda yeah. if you want to move to that yeah, please um, do. Health Trust has been our insuring company for quite some time, and what we do on their behalf is uh, administer the flu vaccine. And I know that many of you have come to the fire department, or we have come here. I know that Nate and some of the other paramedics have provided the flu vaccine to you on site. We've done it for DBW, we do it for police. Um, they were reimbursing us. So we would purchase the vaccine, then they would reimburse. It was never 100%. But it was not a bad deal for us either because we were getting money back and we were able to provide this service to the town. It seems that Health Trust is looking to get out of the business of funding the purchases of the vaccine. And instead, what they're looking to do now is transition and they're going to have their representative come down and provide the service and inoculate people for a flu vaccine. Oh. The interim this year, instead of giving us the reimbursement money, they actually sent the town a check for $2,300. And that arrived at Town Hall, I think, two or three weeks ago. So I'm sitting before you to ask you to accept the $2,300 on behalf of Health Trust to pay for the flu vaccine for the 2019-2020 season. It will help us purchase that vaccine. We'll still be administering it through the fire department until next season. I'll make, make a motion. I'll second. Yeah. yeah. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you so much. Have Thank a you. Evening. We appreciate it. We like you it. in because we like to give you a hard time. Right. Okay. Next we have Christy Pulliam. Uh, the finance director for June Financials. Yes. Good evening, Christy. Good evening. So although July is over, we're doing June since I was um, on vacation at your guys' last meeting. So I have the June Financials, and then I'll be back at your next meeting <coughs> with the financials for the end of July. So Good. this is the sixth report, so the target is 50%. Um, when you look at the revenue, the 2019 revenue is higher than 2018 by $260,981. Um, I just point out again that the majority of that was from a contribution return from Primex. Um, so we're really only over the target by, or over 2018 by $36,067. Mm -hmm. The total income for the month was $751,837. Motor vehicles came in at $331,868. Interest on taxes came in at $3,160. Building permits at $23,383. Departmental income at $242,750. Um, the billing for the SROs went out to the schools. That's why there's such a jump there, because usually the departmental income is in the Probably twenty to thirty thousand dollar range. Parking lots came in at eighty two thousand one hundred and thirteen, and the real estate trust came in at fifty nine thousand three hundred ninety eight dollars. On the expense side, we're forty six point seven percent spent, or under budget by eight hundred thirty two thousand four hundred ninety nine dollars. Um, in June of two thousand and eighteen, we were under budget by seven hundred seventy six thousand. $627, and in June of 2017, we were under budget by 987905 So we're right in the middle of where we've been for like the past two years, so about three-year average. 
In reviewing the target on individual lines, you will see across the board that the regular wages are right, running slightly under budget. I believe that these small gaps will close as we continue throughout the year as wages are based on a 52-week year. Some months have the fifth week, so I think it's just a timing thing there. Legal is at 81.55%, with the main driver being outside council fees at $74,852 or 249.51% spent. Personnel administration is over target at 53.67%. The item of concern here would be the employee separation cost and the bank buyback program. Um, as I've mentioned before, those are running the buyback ran over, but that's the one time for the leave sellout that is done in January. And then the, um, the employee separation cost is getting up there with the retirements we've had this year. Municipal insurance is at 53.89%. However, this will be adjusted because the workers' comp payment covers um, from July 1 of 19 to June 30th of 2020. So there'll be a journal entry to remove some of that money. The police department as a whole, including, including open purchase orders, is at 42.08%. The fire department as a whole, including their purchase orders, is at 47.08%. And public works with purchase orders is at 42.01%. Mm. Um, Fund 24, the recreation, has a balance of $260,268, with $11,157 being granted in scholarships. Cable fund has a balance of $239,921. Er, uh, private detail has a balance of $210,299. And the EMS fund 27 has a balance of $326,687. Wastewater system development charge, the fees collected in 2019, total $23,376, with a balance in the account of $205,024 and approved expenditures of 95,491 from the board. And that is the end of June. Good. Questions, Mrs. Wolseley? We survived. We did. <laughs> Thank we continue you, to survive. Gina? Excellent job, Christy. Um, on the parking revenues through June, which I know is not really saying too much because yeah, right. it's only one month of summer, really. So we're at 152,000, which is up quite a bit from last year at 137,000. Do you have any estimate of what it is? Yeah, I actually now? looked today because um, I thought might that might come up. Um, through August 11th, these are just preliminary numbers, but we look to be up about $77,000 um, nice. in 19 over 18 for income from, um, that's total income, that includes, I didn't break, actually that's strictly from the uh, lot revenue is what I had looked at there. So we it, we appear to be about 70, 77,000 over where we were on August 11th of 2018. Hmm. I think we've had some good weather and I think the casino yeah. had some more shows than they've had in the past too. So. Yeah. Mr. Waddell. Thank you, very good. No and questions. Rusty. No, excellent report, thank you. So, uh, what, do you know anything about the real estate trust funds? Um, um, money? Not a whole lot without having their reports in front of me, mm -hmm. which I had just given out. They came in um, you want last this one? week. So I had put them into your guys' boxes. Yeah, yeah. I guess I understand that they had uh, some success there. I believe that they have, yes. And um, I think that their last meeting was in uh just a couple of weeks ago, and they are televised, so they would be on um, the website. And I know at their meetings, they have other reports that they mm -hmm. use to show where they were at different points in previous years and stuff. So that might be a good reference point to, you know, see where they're at compared to previous years. Yeah, because I've heard that they that it seems to be doing quite good. And mm -hmm. I just was curious if you know anything about it. I didn't really study that report okay. very much. Well, did you ha we have anything else with you? Um, I only had that one item as okay, far as great. I know. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. I hope your vacation you was nice. <laughs> it was. Thank you. Good. And <clears throat> I keep losing my agenda every time I move it around. MRI. 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 Please join us here at the table. <laughs> Good evening, Ed.
Thanks. Thank you, sir. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Presents from heaven. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ed. Good Thanks, man. Ed. Thank you, Ed. Town yeah. awards. Good. <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you. My name is Paul McKenney from Municipal Resources. I think you all know Ed. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I gave you was uh, the proposed letter that we'll be sending to all the uh, residents, taxpayers, uh, indicating what their preliminary value is and their 2018 value. So it's a comparison of the two years. Uh, the second thing was an overall summary of the, uh, the reevaluation values. This is still a working process. We are still, you know, reviewing data and properties as such. But um, hopefully, with your blessing, we can uh, get letters out early next week and then hold hearings beginning the last week of August and then the first two weeks of September. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, the town's value increased by $432,411,300, roughly a 12% increase. Um, there was a ten, an increase of 10% in the residential property values, 22% in the manufactured homes, 17% in the condominiums, and 13% in the condos. Um, this doesn't indicate that every property is going to change at that rate. This is what the overall value of that mm -hmm. strata did. So there's some people are going to change less, some are going to change a little more. Um, one thing that I get at a lot of the hearings is that people come in and say, well, the town went up 12%, why did I go up 15? Um, it's, this is not an indication of what your value went up. I also don't look at the previous values. I'm looking at what the current market is, so I'm trying to derive those values from the sales that we, you know, that we reviewed. Um, we had 939 sales in town that were qualified sales, arm's length transactions, 406 residential, um, 31 manufactured homes, 462 condominiums, and 40 commercial properties. The, um, the ratio um, currently is about 87.6%. About 87.6%. Um, these bring, these Values will bring the median assessment to sale ratios to about 98.8 percent of the of the market. Um, the coefficient of dispersion, or COD, is a measure of our quality. Um, the guideline is that we be below 20 percent. Uh, we're at 7.34, and the price-related differential, or PRD, is uh, to indicate that we're not overvaluing lower priced homes and undervaluing higher priced homes. So w the guideline is that we're between 0 0.98 and 1.03% and we're right at 1, uh, 1.007. Um, so as I said, uh, we will hopefully send out notices uh, on or about August 20th. We will take calls at our office. People will have an opportunity to schedule an appointment online. Yeah. They can call our office and we can schedule an appointment for them uh, or they can send a letter to uh, to the assessor's office here in the town hall and we'll review it by by mail um, calls will, will be taken until september 6th and informal hearings will be held here at the town offices um, from august 26th through september 11th um, if a person cannot attend they're out of town they've left for the, the summer We'll also uh, encourage phone appointments where we can, you know, call them at their convenience and uh, schedule an appointment in that respect as well. I'd be uh, happy to entertain any questions or... Okay, questions, Mrs. Wolves? No, that's pretty comprehensive, and I like the letter. You, it's very clear. Okay, and Regina? So this binder, I assume, is all the... Yes. Every property in town, the 9,800 that or whatever correct. it yeah. is? Yeah. yeah. And... Um, on this, so you have residential, manufactured homes, condominiums, and commercial. So it's not, there's not presented like by neighborhood, it's just by type of home? Um, I guess I don't understand the question. So there are, that binder that you have is listed in map and lot order. Okay. So at the, um, 
once everything's approved and I, we set the, the preliminary values, which you have here, right. then I'll distribute those information in by, by map and lot, by owner's name, and by location, by street mm -hmm. address. So I'll try to get those posted on the town website as well so that people Great. can go and look at their... Um, okay, so that's how they can find out what their... Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll also have um, the Vision Government Solutions website updated yeah. as well. Yeah, we have the online. So we have the online, so they can go on to that vgsi.com and look up uh, the Hampton values there as well and look at their properties, compare it to other similar properties. Okay. So when will this be on the Hampton website? Um, with your approval, I'll try to get it done by next couple, three days. Good. Good. And Mr. Waddell? When, when you do a reval like this, yes. what, what do you figure the, the, the amount's going to be the mistakes and stuff and percentage? I mean, uh, how close do you think you get to actually what it is as opposed to? What the final is going to yeah. be? Yeah. Um, the hearings the hearings are part of the process, but usually we, we're probably within 1% or less. It's usually not much. I mean, you know, okay. we do make corrections at the hearings. People bring in, you know, they may bring in a situation that may not affect their property, but may affect other properties as well. So we don't just look at theirs. We look at equitable situations so that we look at everybody's property. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Rusty? So just, I'm, I'm looking at one here. It's a two-family. It's the, the assessed value before was 3108. Now it's 3448. If somebody has a, a question on that, mm -hmm. what can they do? They can schedule a hearing, if the, uh, and be, I'd be happy to come in and talk to them. We can go over their property record information, make sure that what we have is correct. Um, we'll have a list of the sale properties, so the 939 sales, so we can show them the sales that were in, you know, in the town that we looked at to, to come up to that value. Um, and we can certainly answer any questions of the process of how we did the reevaluation. Okay, I just wanted, I wanted yeah. to get that out there so yes. if people have a question on, on the fact that my, my evaluation went up by $30,000. Right. You know, yeah. and, and how did you come about that? They can call and make an appointment and That's correct, and yeah. And we're ba we based, the, all this information has come from the last two years of real estate sales, from April 1st, 2017 through March 31st of 2019. Okay, I, I think you've done a, a decent job. I just wanted to let people know on how they could do that. Sure. I just yeah, have a couple more questions. Um, thank you. I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. But so are they just calling the assessing office like no. they normally would? Are they no, calling? No. They will call the municipal resources office in, in no, Meredith. In okay. So All right. They can go online. They can right. schedule their they own appointment. I don't see this. All right. Um, it should be in the letter, I think. Right. Yeah, I understand it's in the... Oh, okay. It's going to be in the letter that It'll goes out the to letter. them. It'll be in the letter. So they can... Send the, uh, the address will be there if they want to send information to the town hall. They can call our office or they can go online and schedule an appointment. Okay, and then I just had one more question per an email. I had some questions I sent to the town manager and he uh, gave me some answers. And one of the answers was the email from uh, Christian Pearsale at yes. MRI yes. dated March 18th. Now, he says, according to this timeline, the taxpayer hearings are going to start on August 15th, which final values will come to the Board of Selectmen on October 1st. Right. So the hearings are going to start on August 20th, so that will be a little delay on the right. yes. final hearings. We probably won't till maybe the second week in October. Uh, no. Yeah, we, we should have the hearings done by the uh, mid-September, uh -huh. and it'll take us about a week or two to reconcile all the hearing information. So beginning of October? Right. So we're not going to hold the hearings every day. It'll be like maybe a Monday, Wednesday, and yeah. a Friday. Yeah. Um, so in between the other days, we'll be looking at property, reviewing stuff from people that you know come into the hearings and that sort of thing. Hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Now, <clears throat> what, did, what was the average increase? Uh. Uh, well, 12 percent was the overall change. Uh, yeah, 10 percent was the residential. Mm -hmm. um, but not everybody goes up 10 percent, you know what I'm yeah. saying? I mean, in order to get the average, you need some that are low, lower than that, some that are higher. So there's other reasons also. It's not only the sales, but it could be 
They've put an addition on, they've done some work to the property. Uh, we mm -hmm. may have found an error when we went and visited the property yeah. for some reason. Yeah. So there may be other reasons why people's property goes up more than the 10% mm -hmm. because of the, um, mm -hmm. you know, what's what we've discovered with the property. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but you haven't necessarily been into all of these uh, properties. No, we've been into um, probably 35 or 40% of the sale properties. Mm -hmm. We, um, yeah. you know, we we went around, we measured and listed, and listed means doing an interior inspection, all the 939 sales that we used for the, uh, you know, for the analysis. Mm -hmm. However, you can't get into any, you know, all of those properties. But we try to do it at times that, you know, where people were home and we could get into a fair amount of them. 35 percent is actually a pretty fair number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So does it have any? Like I see some here that are over 20 percent. That are in the same areas where others across the street have gone down, and, and yeah. you know, in this case, one is a, a million-dollar property, and the one that went up the most is one that was three hundred and twenty-nine thousand, went up um, about twenty-five percent. Right. So, is there a correlation that that's a, a less expensive home and an expensive neighborhood, and that's raised it? Um, that's possibly the sales indicated a higher price. Mm -hmm. uh, a higher increase in that neighborhood, or it could be the lower end properties are selling, are appreciating at a higher rate than the higher end properties. Uh -huh. There's just a better, that's why the, uh, the condominiums and the manufactured homes went up 17 and 22 percent. Mm -hmm. People are trying to get into the, the home market and they can't get in at the million dollar range, so that they're buying the lower end properties or the lower priced properties to get into the market. So those values are going up much higher. Um, the other thing we found that, you know, as we get older, um, people want to get into one floor living. Ranches, Ranches are, seem to be selling for higher than, you know, the colonials that used to be, yeah. you know, the top seller, the capes and colonials. <laughs> so. Well, okay. that's good. I'm sure you're going to, with, with this particular person, you're going to have your hands full. <laughs> <laughs> but the other one that I mentioned is always upset. Yeah. And theirs went down, so she'll be happy for a change. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, any other questions? No. Nope. Good job. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. We appreciate it, and thanks Thank for coming in. And today. certainly if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, um, you know, let me know, and we can uh, certainly answer those as well. Thank okay, you. great. Thank, Thank you. you. You're Thank welcome. Thank you. Next we have uh, John Nyan, president of the Hampton Chamber of Commerce. Good evening, and uh, with me tonight is uh, Colleen Westcott, who is my director of events and marketing. So we will be uh, kind of sharing the podium uh, and giving our annual informational uh, update on the annual Hampton Beach Seafood Festival. So this year, this is an important year for the festival because it's celebrating our 30th anniversary, believe it or not. and. Um, last couple of weeks I've been talking to individuals that go back to that first year when I was at the uh, South Beach uh, State Park and all of the things that have taken place since that first year. So we're all excited about having the 30th <coughs> this year. Um, our theme um, that we have come up with was um, it's kind of a, a subtle theme and that was uh, we want you back. Um, and the reason for that is that Sure, there's 30 years of celebration, so we want you to come back for our 30th. But the subtleness of that is uh, because of the uh, Legionnaire disease and, uh, and other things that were out of our control last year, the people that did not come to the festival last year, we want them back this year. A uh, couple of things that uh, we have done to change a little bit of the festival uh, on Friday. Um, it has been typically uh, a four to nine o'clock event. Uh, this year we're opening up the festival uh, starting at one o'clock in the afternoon so that we will have a full uh, day on Friday of the festival um, at the same price, by the way. We're also, um, as a matter of fact, about a, an hour and a half ago, uh, we went live on uh, social media where we'll be um, sending out uh, to 
folks uh, in all of our service area, the five communities that the, uh, the chamber represents. And we're gonna be offering a, a pre-sales on wristbands for Friday night at half price. So uh, the week before the festival, if anybody's interested in coming down on Friday night, they can stop by the, uh, the office, the chamber office, and buy a wristband that goes for $5, pay $2.50. So it's a half price um, kind of sale. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Colleen who will give you a couple updates on sponsors and other things. Good evening. We're very fortunate to have great sponsors that return to the festival year after year. The presenting sponsor service Credit Union will be back, Unitil, Geico, New Hampshire Distributors, AARP, New Hampshire National Guard, Seacoast Coca-Cola, Auto Fair, and the River 92.5 are all coming back this year. We have some new sponsors that are also local businesses. We have Wicked Flannel, FW Webb, Seabrook Park, and Noka Beverages coming in new to the festival this year. We have new opportunities for sponsors. We have the Seafood Fest 5K and the Cornhole Tournament, which opened up new opportunities for um, businesses to get involved and sponsor. We're very appreciative of our sponsors, so we have two events thanking our sponsors this year. Our presenting sponsor, Service Credit Union, will have a party on Friday right on the beach where we'll thank them. And then the rest of the sponsors will have a sponsor welcome breakfast Saturday morning at 8 a.m. where we'll serve our sponsors a hot breakfast and welcome them to our, the community and show our appreciation for them supporting the Seafood Festival. We know that for our sponsors to be successful at Seafood Festival, we have to have a good turnout. So our marketing has been in full force this year, promoting the 30th anniversary. The River 92.5 as a sponsor is running a robust marketing campaign for us, which will start mid-August. If you lived in uh, Raymond or Epping area, you may have already received the marketing wrap in your newspapers that went out a couple weeks ago. If you're in Hampton and Exeter, you'll be getting the program, the Seafood Fest program, in your newspaper at the end of the month. We're doing our digital. We're doing geo-farming again this year for advertising. We're also trying a new um, avenue. We did a YouTube um, video, and that'll be um, a promotion. We'll be advertising on YouTube as well. What we're advertising and what we're promoting for folks to come and enjoy at the festival is, of course, all, of course, all the great food, the entertainment, the crafters. Food, we have 40-plus diver, uh, diverse mix of options for dining. We've got entertainment on two stages. This year, we're very excited to have the American Idol contestant, Alex Preston, performing at the event. Our crafters um, are sold out, and we have a waiting list for folks to get in. Exciting for this year is our new selection of beverages that will be available. We will have Coca-Cola as we typically do. We'll have New Hampshire distributors as we typically do. But this year we'll be welcoming Joya Craft Cocktail for the first time. Robert Mondavi will be our wine sponsor and uh, what we'll be serving in the wine tents this year. Also, a local company, NOCA, is a non-carbonated alcohol beverage, which we'll be um, promoting this year as well. Along with some of our traditional events that we have throughout the, uh, the weekend, uh, such as our opening ceremony, which will be at 6 o'clock on Friday, which is the annual ribbon cutting, if you will. Um, and let me just stop there and just uh, personally, you'll, you'll rece receive something from us in writing, but personally, let me invite all of you to attend the uh, opening ceremony. Um, this is going to be a little different this year. Uh, we're going back in time and recognizing uh, any organization or individual that has actually been involved with the Seafood Festival for all 30 years, hmm. uh, which includes the town of Hampton. Um, so we will have special recognition at the uh, opening ceremony for those individuals and organizations. Um, more tradition, the lobster roll eating contest, which is uh, always big. And uh, one thing that uh, we were able to do this year with the help of Colleen was we actually have, believe it or not, a professional lobster roll eating individual. 
who has gone uh, throughout the country uh, competing for uh, big money. So he will be one of our contestants. Actually, John, it's a she. Oh, it's a she. Sorry. <laughs> she sorry. is professionally and nationally ranked eater, yes. Um, grief. We have our fireworks once again on Saturday evening and then skydiving to close on Sunday. However, we also have um, three new uh, events that we're excited about. Uh, on Friday night um, in the culinary tent, now for those of you that are familiar with the festival, Saturday and Sunday we have Wicked Bites come in from Boston and then they do chef demonstrations throughout Saturday and Sunday. That left the culinary tent kind of empty on Friday. So we decided to bring in uh, New Hampshire Made, which is all uh, businesses that make products here in the state of New Hampshire. Mm. And we have 15 of them signed up uh, to provide um, products uh, to, to be able to sell, um, all of which will be sold uh, in, in the culinary tent. Um, and these products are made in New Hampshire. Um, we've added an additional cornhole tournament uh, that has become popular. Um, last year we had it, and it was such a success that the, uh, the organization that runs it for us uh, asked us to run two. We agreed, and so we'll have two cornhole contests, one at noontime and one at 4 o'clock on Saturday. And then we also have on Sunday morning, bright and early, 9 o'clock, we have a 5K road race. Um, that will go up uh, onto Ocean Boulevard, turn around on 18th Street and come back down. And the last 200 yards of the race will be on the beach. Um, and the finish line will be at the Beach Cabana Bar. It's estimated right now that we'll, bet we'll have about 700 to 800 runners in this uh, 5K. Um, it's a very short. Um, the fastest runner will probably be a 15-minute runner. Uh, mm -hmm. The slowest will be probably a 50-minute runner. Um, operations. A um, couple of weeks ago, we met with uh, uh, Mr. Welch and, and the management team, the directors, to kind of give them an overview of what we uh, were planning on doing this year. Um, and we're also looking at partnering um, with other um, town departments, um, one of which and I, I would like to invite uh, Chief Sawyer, up for a minute to talk about one of the, uh, the things that we'd like to partner with. Chief? With the influx of vendors coming into the community, it causes a lot of congestion down the beach. So I was approached by the committee to possibly look into letting uh, the festival utilize the island path lot uh, for the vendor parking. Uh, I would agree. I think that's a good idea to get some of that congestion out of the area closest to the festival. It's close enough for the vendors to get their product up into the event area if they need to. Um, I believe, what's the price we're talking about? 60, $65 per vendor vehicle uh, that would be re given to the town. Uh, we would just print up a um, something very simple on uh, colored paper that they could put in the windshield that shows that they've been paid. That way we don't have to man the booth all the time. Mm. And we can just go through. There will be signs posted that this is for vendor parking only. All others will be towed. Mm. And in that event, the officers can go in routinely, just search to make sure that the vehicles have the proper documentation, and any vehicles that don't will be towed. Yeah. So, But I would need permission from the board for that. So is it $65 uh, per, per vehicle? Yes. So if one vendor has two vehicles, it's $130. Correct. Each vehicle will have to have mm -hmm. one of our, uh, not a placard. We're just going to keep it very simple. Uh, we're going to just keep it on colored paper from the police department. We'll number them. Uh, as John gets the vendor list that wants these, I'll provide mm -hmm. those to him, and he'll provide the uh, payment. Do you have an estimate on how much money that is? How many vendors are we talking about, John? We could be talking about 30 to 50. 30 to 50 vendors. So uh, is that the same amount of money that the, uh, the parking lot usually provides? I would have to do further research on that for you, um, although I don't believe we really get big numbers in that island path a lot for that event. Because mm -hmm. that's for all three days. Well, quite frankly, the, the best thing that's ever happened with that event, I wish we could use it for things like the 4th of July, is the remote parking and people come down on the buses. Mm -hmm. 
it really has alleviated our traffic issues down there. It's made it so much more manageable. Mm -hmm. So as I recall, Island Path is not a big lot, but I can try to get those numbers from yeah. Christy tomorrow. Oh, it's okay. That's roughly thirty-two fifty, and I think I talked with you earlier. You said it would be somewhere around three thousand. Mr. Mrs. Chairman, Wesley. will you accept a motion to go ahead at, with that uh, configuration for the festival? Yeah. Do we have a second? I'll second it. All those in favor? I'll agree, but I think that we need to really consider using that lot for residents sometimes as well. Okay. Abstain. So we have four and one abstention, so that's going to happen. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Chief. Any other issues you need me for for that? Um, if you could just stay for a minute. Sure. Um, the other thing that uh, we also have worked out, uh, and this is our third year doing it, is working uh, through an agreement with uh, Parks and Rec. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we have an obligation to provide handicap transportation yeah. Yeah. Um, so that we use uh, the, uh, the town rec bus. Uh, we contract with the uh, town of Hampton. Uh, we pay them twelve. We pay you twelve hundred dollars yeah. to use the bus for the weekend. Um, the drivers are uh, yeah. rec department employees, and the uh, town uh, hall parking lot is used as the uh, pickup and drop off. Yeah. Do, do we have a part? Do we need a motion for that, Mr. Welch? I'll give yes, sir. Yeah. I'll second. All those in favor? In unanimous. One done. abstention. Okay. Um, all of our partner vendors in terms of operations, gas, electric, mm -hmm. uh, ice, trash, everything, uh, we've been fortunate enough to bring everybody back once again um, so that everybody can probably do their jobs blindfolded, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we do have one new vendor this year, uh, and that's our tent company. Um, after nine straight years, Arena Tent has pulled out. Uh, I should say we have pulled them out uh, oh. due to a price increase, which was unacceptable to us. So we have hired a, a new tent company that's based out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. They uh, do a lot of Boston festivals. So I'm confident that they, uh, they know what they're doing um, and that we will be once again complying with um, all of the uh, regulations down there where we have 1,300-pound um, um, <coughs> blocks yeah. uh, that will be... Uh, holding these tents down. The, um, as you know, staffing um, for, an, for an event like this requires not only a lot of volunteers, which will have over 500 volunteers, but we uh, will also have a, a fair number of paid employees to help set up the festival, manage the festival, and then break down the festival. Uh, we continue to encourage local hiring. Uh, we have gone out to Public Works and other departments in the, in the uh, town and also in the community to look for individuals that might be looking for uh, an extra couple of dollars to work the festival mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. And so uh, um, I'm happy to report that uh, we're almost fully staffed Good. of all of the individuals that we need to hire for the festival. Um, based on the, um, on the, uh, the events uh, of the recent events that we've experienced around the country, um, the chief and I have spoken a couple of times and we continue to speak on making sure that uh, safety mm -hmm. is our number one priority uh, for anybody that comes to the festival. Um, I can tell you firsthand, uh, since I've been involved in the festival, uh, the chief, uh, both chiefs as a matter of fact, have done an outstanding job uh, with uh, protection and safety mm -hmm. for everybody that enters those gates. and. Um, I'm sure that uh, he'll continue to work hard, um, and I have already expressed to him that he has the Chamber's 110% uh, support in anything that he wants to do, decides to do to make this festival safe, then we are, we're all on board on that. So, The concerns John expressed, uh, we have talked uh, with the recent tragedies we saw in California at a festival, uh, the Gawak Festival. Um, that did spur me to make some phone calls to Homeland Security and the FBI just to let them know we're, we're coming up with our event. They had already begun uh, some of the behind the scenes work they do for us, uh, scanning the internet, looking for any type of okay. issues going on that we need to be concerned about, any, any issues that would happen in California. Is there any connection to anything? you know, nationally, so those are ongoing issues. I, I can't really disclose the discussions mm -hmm. in depth, but I just wanted you to know that our discussions are constant with New Hampshire Homeland Security and 
the Bureau and all of our partners <coughs> to try to make this as safe event as we can. Um, people should understand that changes could occur. Um, we've tried to keep those changes that we've applied over the years somewhat under the radar so it really doesn't bring a lot of attention to it. I, mean, I think the biggest one we made was years ago. We started bringing in uh, elements of the National Guard to assist us and elements of the Seacoast Emergency Response Team that are very visible at the, some of the main entrances. We try to present those to, to give people that sense of, of, of safety. Some of the other things aren't as visible, uh, that, but those safety uh, measures we take for all of our events are ongoing. Good. So. Okay. And that uh, finishes our report. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Wolseley. Then you're, not, you're not going to make sure that none of the businesses are blocked by having trucks and stuff put in the way down at the beach, right? Everything's going to be clear so the businessmen can conduct business. Are you talking about the side streets? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the only major street that we use, um, this the, was a discussion at the Because a poor last man year. last year, I guess, on the, the other. Uh, and two weeks ago. Uh, yeah, he is. He's in a new business. This is C Street? Number one. Ah, uh, yeah. So as long as the, the business owners can get in and out, uh, the rest sounds really good. John, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump in again real quick on the vehicle issue. Uh, as one of the measures we take protecting the event area, obviously we've seen those tragedies where either by design or by intoxication we've had people breach into event areas and cause great harm. Mm -hmm. And we're very cognizant of that. And we've taken measures to try to block that with physical devices. But one of the things we also use is use larger vehicles like the, uh, the new ve the, um, emergency management vehicle that we have. That'll be used to block certain streets at certain key times. Mm -hmm. Okay, So there may be those times when a vehicle may block a business at my direction. For public safety reasons, but it's not going to be ongoing. No, no, no. We block this guy off for the whole festival. No, I mean, in the streets that I would use those vehicles, don't tend to be ones that have business fronts right there. So we're trying to avoid that. I know that that, that bothered people at times, but a lot of that had a lot to do with me trying to prevent a tragedy from occurring. But we're trying to work around their concerns. Okay, that's good. So, so this this um, map basically shows you yep. where most of our operational vendors go. Um, and the uh, over the past two years, um, there are eight businesses on C, C Street. Mm -hmm. I've spoken um, to seven of the eight. I've tried to speak to the eight, uh, but uh, left a message for him to call me so I could explain the, uh, the street layout. Um, all other seven uh, have no issues at all with okay. us parking our vehicles. Um, the design recommendation that this board had asked us to look at last year, uh, we went back and I met with Chief Sawyer and we came up with this plan that you, you have in front of you tonight. Um, and that um, this, this map clearly shows that there is no uh, parking, no trash trucks, no parking at all um, in front of Sabo's uh, sub. Um, as a matter of fact, the closest truck is a property to the west side of Sabos. So did they and meet with you? I requested uh, for them to meet. I've not heard back from Lenny. <clears throat> um, and then finally, uh, the remote parking, which um, we wanted to make sure we took care of at nighttime when the uh, festival closes. Uh, we will be moving both the trash trucks and the ice truck off site so that there will be no vehicles. Uh, not, those three vehicles will not be on C Street overnight. Yeah. Uh, because of course, as you can imagine, if the trash trucks sat there all night, yeah. which won't happen. Okay. Gina? Yeah, you uh, addressed the question I had. Um, I spoke with Lenny a couple times and he actually sent in an email and his concern is as a new owner of Sabo's, it has been brought to my attention the previous owner came before the Board of Selectmen last August to inform the board he wanted to keep the business open for Seafood Festival by many con customers' requests. The problem from opening in the past with the dumpsters packed in front of the business, I'm sure you can refresh yourself with the minutes from last year. He called the chamber, Hampton Police, Hampton Fire, and was told different stories as to why the dumpsters were parked in front of Sabo's. Sabo's. He was approached by the chamber and was offered a booth in the festival. He declined the offer. He was already paying rent. 
So why take a booth, not to mention Sabo's is a great spot for the festival. He opened but encountered commercial trucks and dump trucks parked on C Street during the three-day festival. Sabo Subs has been part of the fabric to Hampton Beach for over 30 years and will continue to do so. The families that stop in and tell their story how Sablos has been part of their Hampton Beach stay from generations down is very humbling and we are so proud to be a part of this. These are the new owners as the prior owners sold their business. Good. They left. Um, so many requests come in to ask if we'll be open for the festival and our answer is yes. We are hoping that C Street will be safe from dumpsters along with park, dump and commercial trucks so businesses like ours will not suffer from customers that want to visit our establishment and enjoy a bite to eat while sitting in an open-air dining room with the, without the smell of dumpsters filled with rotten food or the congestion of huge commercial trucks. Yeah. Sai Lenny Paul, Sabo Sub, 6 C Street. So that's the issue I have because even though it's only one Hampton business, it is a Hampton business, and that's what I represent. So yeah. I hope that you guys can work it out so that they can enjoy the weekend just like everyone else. Yeah, that's good. Mr. Waddell. No, I think it's a good plan. I think you've, you've worked with the chief. You've worked with everybody. I think you've done a good job. And I also, you know, have heard from um, Lenny from his uh, new uh, business there at Sabo Subs. And, uh, you know, I'm all for trying to make it that you work with him so that it's, he doesn't have a problem. Mm -hmm. Is he a member of the Chamber of Commerce? No. No. He owns three Hampton Beach businesses, though. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If he wants to work with it. Why doesn't he contact them if they ask for a meeting? That's. Well, I know the other people were a member of the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. I don't mean they has to be a member, but he yeah. talked to them. Yeah, no, I don't think In it okay. matters that he's not a member, but I just was curious. Okay. Um, thank you very much <coughs> for coming in tonight. Thank you. Being patient. Thank you. Did you check with the weatherman now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's hope. <laughs> Um, be good if it happened. Next, we have the town manager's report. Mr. Chairman, uh, the American Legion, post number 35, will be conducting a rededication ceremony of the Global War for Terrorism Memorial Monument on September 11, 2019, at 6 p.m. at their facility at 69 High Street. The Board of Selectmen and the general public are invited to attend. The Aquarium Water Company is currently planning for water main replacements on Mill Road from Reddington Landing to Anne's Lane, excluding the new portion that was paved at Anne's Lane, and from Mace Road to Little River Road to Anne's Lane. The company will give more details once bids are received and a detailed construction schedule is prepared. And they'll be giving that to us, and we'll be happy to post that up on the town's website and to let people know what that, what's going to ha happen there. The Department of Public Works is preparing the, to begin the replacement of culverts on Park Avenue. Construction is scheduled to begin on August 19th and will continue into mid-October. During this period, Park Avenue will be closed to through traffic. Please see the detour details on the Public Works and Town websites. Closure number one, and I've got a plan in front of me here, is going to be uh, that will be replaced in the first culvert, which will be located to the west, the Route 1 side of Tuck Field entrance. That's where the uh, Historical Society is. This phase will, phase will be completed first. Park Avenue will be closed at this location, requiring that all access to the high school, Tuck Field, and any homes to the east of this culvert will be accessed by Park Avenue via Winnicott Road. The second phase will replace the culverts in the Kids' Kingdom's parking lot and the culvert across Park Avenue located to the west, the Route 1 side of Kids' Kingdom parking lot entrance. Park Avenue will be closed at this location, requiring all access to the high school, Tuck Field, and any homes to the west of the culvert be accessed by Park Avenue via Route 1. Homes to the east of this location can be accessed via Park Avenue from Winnicott Road. Uh, we've also received a letter from the Commissioner of Transportation, which came in today. Um, I announced that at a previous, the previous meeting of the board that the walkway in front of uh, the casino leading to the seashell uh, was planned to be closed and eliminated 
uh, in the current review of walkways in, uh, in the Route 1A area. The Commissioner has reversed that. That walkway is staying. It will be open. It will be, remain a permanent part of the beach walkway system uh, on Route 1A. We've also received a communication from uh, the Municipal Highways Division at the State Department of Transportation announcing the Hampton uh, Beach, uh, the Hampton Highway Block Grant aid, which will be received during the next fiscal year of the state. I just want to call everybody's attention to the fact that um, the July and October 2019 payments will be $97,000 each. Uh, with some minor dollars following it. Uh, and around figures, the uh, January and April 2020 is going to drop to, to $64,700 because of the change in aid for highway block grants. Uh, That's okay. all I have, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Now, does um, is that going to affect the pig roast, which is on August 24th? Mm. Um, I would say yes. It's going to affect the pig roast. Yeah, because we asked way in advance about yep. that. It, it, access uh, for the pig roast will be from uh, Winnicott Road. Road. So there will be access. There won't be a problem with the access, but it'll be from Winnicott Road. And that will be clearly marked. Yep, it will be. There'll be clear detour signs, and this is all going up on the town website, so everybody can see exactly where you have to go and what's going on. Okay. Um, questions for the town manager's, re manager's report, Mrs. Wolseley. Nope. I'm Did good with the town manager. Um, yeah, just one thing that's not in your report, but you, some people had come to you and talked to you about changing the handicapped parking from one side of the building to the other you had talked about. Uh, can yeah. we do that under old business? Okay, we'll do it under old business. Okay. Um, so, uh, Rusty, did you All have set. any Thank questions? Um, okay, <laughs> so moving under old business. Jim. All right, <laughs> Fred. <laughs> Sir. People had asked you about moving that uh, that parking from one side of the building to the other because access was a lot easier on the other side of the building. I asked Public Works to do two things. One was to lay that out and, and to have the uh, area measured as far as grade is concerned to see whether or not it meets the grade requirements. Yeah. They've indicated preliminarily it does. Yeah. Unfortunately, even though they were told not to repaint the existing handicapped access on the east side of the building. Mm -hmm. The contractor was uh, didn't pay any attention to that and repainted it. So we're going to have to redo all the painting in this parking lot Okay. in order to remark that. Yeah. That's been scheduled to be done. I just don't know when it's going to occur. Okay, but we are going to move it. Yes, we are. Okay. We're going to have to move it because it's not accessible okay. by grade on the other side. Yep. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, other old business, Mrs. Wolseley? No, nothing. Regina? I just have a couple questions. Uh, Mr. Welch, I happened to come in when you were with Chris Jacobs this morning, and we were talking about a couple things. On the force main replacements, has that, uh, replacing the church force mains, has that affected what's being received to the wastewater treatment plant? Well, we know that the wastewater treatment plant's receiving less material than it was before. Uh, conjecture is that it may be the result of the force mains. As we know, the force mains were let's say a little thin, um, <laughs> just a little. They were popping oh. holes, oh. so we had to do major replacements, uh, actually two of them as opposed to a third one. Um, those mains have been there for many, many years under the marsh, and uh, since we have replaced them, our total contribution of material going into the, the wastewater treatment plant has gone down substantially. Good. Normally this time of the year we're expected to be over 3 million gallons per day uh, in treatment and on some days with high tides we're expected to be 4 to 5 million gallons a day. We have yet to, we've only exceeded 3 million gallons on two occasions that I'm aware of and the rest of the months we have been somewhere between 250 and 290 gallons, 1,000 gallons per day. Wow. Excuse me, two million nine hundred thousand dollars per day. Good. So the conjecture is that the force mains had something to do with that. Don't know if that's all that has to do with it because we do have areas out in the marsh where we have transmission lines uh, that go from the south end of the beach into the uh, pumping station on Church Street, mm -hmm. and we we still need to do work on those and to reseal them. So. Once that's done, our, our total intake should, should drop again. Good. 
And the other question I brought up when Director Jacobs was in the office was that Smutty Nose has installed the digesters, and we're sort of waiting to see what the uh, levels are going to read after it. It, uh, it should go down substantially. They're talking about uh, instead of uh, as much as six or 700 uh, per day, we're talking about 200 to 250 per day. So, so more than 50%. Uh, yeah, it's more than 50% reduction. Good. Uh, Thank you. But we still have to go through the planning phase and the testing phase in order to verify that. Thank you. Um, Rusty, any old business? All set. Thank you. No. Um, <clears throat> under old business, I would like to ask um, Mr. Welch. Um, now, we have had people complaining about the noise of some of the entertainment license licensees. Um, <clears throat> now, if we want to, um, the way that the entertainment license are written today is what we try to enforce, right? Yes. Yeah, so if we do want to have any changes, it would be via uh, a warrant article? We would have to amend the ordinance, yes. Oh. Yeah. So I think that we really have to start giving some consideration if we do want to raise these questions. Yes. Um, and because if we do, this should be added to your list of warrant articles that we want to consider. Um, so I think we need to look at that um, because there are issues. I mean, hopefully we're not going to have more people complaining like what happened at um, this last weekend. And I really don't know what, how mm -hmm. it was. You know, we have, but we have had complaints. I understand you had more than one, Regina. I had that one from someone on. So you only Rick. had one. Yeah, and I forwarded. I told him I didn't know what he had done, so I told him to the call the police department, and then I mm -hmm. I also yeah. copied Fred on it. Well, there are some things that we're going to need to take a look at. So I think that should be part of our conversation when we get to mm -hmm. Warren articles, whether we want to make a yeah. change on the entertainment um, license. And I would suggest that anyone that has any um, uh, issues with what they consider are pertaining to the entertainment license to, you know, give us some information and write some letters in and let us know okay. because people have been complaining all year. Now's <laughs> your time. This is the time we can do something for about it next year if we all deem that something needs to be done. Good time. So um, moving on to new business, we have uh, the gentleman that's going to talk about the street. Is he here? No parking? Like the here. No parking. I don't know who he was. Was he here? I, I, did, I wasn't looking for him. Should so we yeah. wait until yeah. another agenda? Well, we'll give him a, a few moments if he is going to be here. Uh, but let's move on to the next one. Resolution to Congress to enact the Energy Innovation and Carbon uh, Dividend Act of 2019. Mr. Chairman, it can't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> the amount of carbon we're putting in the air at the moment, according to our best-named scientists, is telling us that it's going to continue to warm the Earth. And if action isn't taken by their estimate in the next 15 years to reverse that trend, then we're going to have a catastrophic problem with the Earth's temperature. Yeah. Um, I would encourage you to, in fact, sign that resolution mm -hmm. and to send it to Congress uh, as requested by the City of Portsmouth, who did a very good job in, in uh, putting it together. Um, I'd also suggest that uh, as we're looking at the budget time for next year, that uh, we might want to change to uh, gas instead of gasoline, but gas to run our, our vehicles and look at what it's going to cost to convert those. I'd, I'd certainly be having um, H2O coming out of the tailpipe mm. than I would carbon uh, because that's going to help. Every time we do that, it's going to help. Mm -hmm. uh, batteries are probably not the right thing to do with the type of heavy equipment that we run. Uh, it could cost a small fortune, and disposal fees are enormous. So we would have to look into that. But I would suggest that, in fact, we look into something of that nature to <clears throat> eventually save costs, save our engines, save our equipment, and yeah. spend less money. We're going to add it to our list. Questions, right? Mrs. Wolseley. No, I don't have any. I agree with Fred. Just add it to our list, I'd say, for mm -hmm. warrant articles. Mm -hmm. Do you have a wording for the, uh, oh, uh, for the next one, for the no parking on both sides. Uh, we're we're talking about this right now, Mrs. Okay, well, I, that's, okay. Let's do it. Uh, and um, Regina. I agree with Fred on the vehicles. Um, I just looking at this, I looked up the bill, and uh, 
it says it just gone to three committees in January of 2019, mm -hmm. U.S. Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce, and Foreign Affairs. Right. So, I mean, mm -hmm. shouldn't we wait till it comes out of those committees? I mean, they're federal elected officials. I mean, I just don't, don't understand. I, I think the problem is that there's some reluctance for them to come out of committee. Yeah. That's part of the problem that's going on in Washington right yeah. now is that innovative solutions to global <laughs> warming doesn't seem to be able to make it to the floor. Right. And that they'd like to try to force some of that out so at least it'll be debated on the floor. They may vote it down. Yeah. But if you don't get it onto the floor, nothing can happen. You're right. Because this is going to start a fee of $15. Rate begins in $15 in 2019 and increases $10 each year. Mm -hmm. yeah. So who's going to get feed? Uh, I would assume that that's going to be a carbon uh, transfer uh, si similar to what they're using now. Uh, it's, it's, it's a basis that you have to yeah. purchase your carbon credits if you're an industrial user. Yeah, I see. Mr. Waddell? No, I'm set. Rusty? Also. Yeah. Did you have it? Nothing. Um, <clears throat> okay. Did you need a uh, motion to? Yes, that's what I was going I to would say. suggest that if you're going to actually sign this and, and move yep. it on to Congress and to the President and so forth, that you actually take a vote to do that. I'll make okay. a motion. I'll second. Yep. Okay. We, any other comment? Nope. All in favor of sending this resolution? For? Regina? You're voting against? Yes. Okay, she's voting against, okay. so that's four, four, one against. Okay. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I guess we don't have the gentleman that did ask. Rick, was he, did he, he sent a letter in. Was, he did. Was he, he given an he, appointment? Yes, from what I understand. He wasn't given an appointment. He, 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 I don't believe he wanted to come. He just wanted the board to consider the facts, and frankly, what I would do is I would recommend, given the chief's performance this evening and what he said about all the different problems that are there, yeah. I think we need to go take a look at each one of those streets. Well, Excellent. they called me there. and said he did ask for an appointment, yeah. so that's what I was told, and yeah. it was that's that they asked for my permission to put him on. Um, <coughs> so again. Um, we heard what the chief had to say. If anyone out there and these gentlemen came in here tonight to uh, tell us their view on this, so if anyone, including you gentlemen, you should write a letter uh, stating and ask whoever else that you know that might be interested yeah. to send a letter. We're going to be taking comments until uh, not we meet again in two weeks and then again after that in two weeks so that in a month from now we're going to take a look at all the reports that we get yeah. So anyone that wants to say something and uh, express how they feel, they can either send an email, a letter, they can either drop it off here at the town managers, right. or they can just send an email, and uh, it will be distributed to everybody. Are we so on the record? Are we going to make comments from the board? because uh, We can, yeah. yeah. Did you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, I don't want to become Greenwich, Connecticut, or Darien, Connecticut, you know, snob towns that don't allow people to access the waterfront. I mean, the waterfront's for everybody. I mean, it, it is Hampton residents, but the waterfront is the waterfront, and the beach is the beach, and it, we, we should really, you know, leave it open. I think Massachusetts and Connecticut are one of the only two states that limit access to waterfront that allow it. You know, New Hampshire has equal access to waterfront for all people, and I think we should... I think we should maintain that. I think, and also, if you close off parking on one street, it's just going to leak over to another street and it's just going to cause a problem. So I, I don't want to become a snob town. Mm -hmm. Krusty, did you have any comments? No, I was just going to say, you know, when you push it from one, it goes to another. And how far are we going to push this? I, you know, I think uh, there is limited parking down there to begin with. We already have, we, we worked on this a lot a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, the, if the police chief says we need some better signage and stuff, well, let's look at that. But I think if we start regulating who can park there, then uh, I think it's, it's a slippery slope. And I feel that it already, there has been a determination, but we heard the police chief just mention they're not giving tickets to the people that are parking on the wrong side of the street. That is a big problem. And the other big problem is the people putting um, rocks, uh, people are brazen. They use cones, yeah. Uh, yeah. all sorts of things. And I will mention that one reason why people do complain 
um, about people parking is there have been reports that have been, the police have been at even recently where people are camping in their vehicles on those side streets. And then another problem is wherever the pump house is, which is what, around 17th Street? The old pump station. Yeah, yeah. people are going to the bathroom in the woods there. Oh. And that's something that needs to, uh, when we had our big talk and people were invited, there were a lot of people who came and complained about that. So, you know, we all have to sort of um, police our own activities and make sure these type of things don't happen. Um, it's been a long history uh, here at the board that we not remove any parking if not necessary. Yeah. But, um, and then whoever the one that was mentioned on Cranberry, um, I know that uh, I personally went down there and uh, measured all the, not all of the streets, but the streets that are, are adjacent to Cranberry uh, because a lot of people that are on that street wanted no parking there. And uh, they had, even the Conservation Commission was back and, you know, was asking for them. And I did go down there and measure the streets. That is the widest streets. That's the one street that should have parking on it. So I was happy to hear you say that. It's over 10 feet wide, that street, which is a lot bigger than the others. And before uh, uh, we meet in the next month, I'm going to go down and measure all the side streets, too, uh, <laughs> just for the hell of it, because they are different. It's amazing. Um, some of them are private, too. They were um, all made for cottages. Of the numbered yeah, streets, right. some are private? Right. Not the numbered streets, but oh. they, some of the private streets are not uniformly laid out. They're, mm -hmm. they're not of uniform length or, or width. Yeah, they should be, because that was all done probably by the town, I guess, because... It was, uh, yeah. but it appears that they, they're not all, shall we say, quite equal. Yeah, I guess not. So we'll all be taking a look at that. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, for coming in. Regina? I have one thing. Yeah, I agree. We don't want to become a snob town, but there are snob towns in New Hampshire. Rye and Northampton took a bunch of their parking away. So I definitely oh, yeah. don't want to see that happen in Hampton. And mm -hmm. I appreciate you guys coming in. Thank you. Thank you okay. Mr. Chairman, real yeah. quickly. First of all, we want to make sure that we have adequate fire lanes on those streets. Oh, yeah. I don't and know what you're parking on park out there. In the fire lanes. But it's got to be, we've got to have the fire lanes. And I do, I would like to see the wording that the individuals come up with for the uh, don't do it in the woods. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, any other new business? I just have one quick yep. thing I want, because I told Mike Edgar that I was going to bring it up. We had a USS Virginia committee meeting upstairs, and a couple weeks ago, July 27th, they had a surfer training day, and 12 to 14 sailors came down. The boards, everything, Cinnamon Rainbows sponsored the whole thing. They paid yeah. for the whole thing. So I just wanted to uh, let the public know that, yeah, good you know, it's nice okay. when the community gets together like that. Okay. Any other new business? No. Nope. Nope. We need to get and going. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you could uh, entertain a motion to go into a non-public session under RSA 91 hyphen capital A, colon 3, Roman 2, small a, uh, Personnel, small c, reputation, and small e, uh, litigation. I would so moved. It. Second. Okay. Aye. And that will that will be a, a roll call. Aye. 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 Time. Aye. Time. What would you like? Nine thirty-seven. Nine thirty-seven. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for everyone Apple for tuning time. in tonight. Thank you, gentlemen.